mainstream media such as TV and radio for e-cigarettes. While we strongly support measures to further protect young people particularly from cigarettes, we believe that the current regime um, remains appropriate and has the powers in place within it to make changes where required. Although I have to say my honourable friend, I suspect, may yet be proved right when he suggests that the other place may return to this at some point. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, conscious of time, I have outlined the many steps this Government is taking to address some of the major lifestyle challenges to our health. This Bill represents another step in the direction of preventive health care and building a healthier society, an aim I know we all share. And I hope the House will support the amendments we have brought forward at this stage to strengthen these measures. I would also want to update the House at this point in the context of the importance of an integrated approach and how this can improve public health measures to two steps that the Secretary of State is taking today that will put NHS staff and technology at the heart of our long-term planning and that will allow us to take forward the integrated approach that has proved so vital during this pandemic and that has proved so vital to public health. I, I'm afraid I won't. I'm afraid I won't. Um, and I suspect that this point will be pertinent to the debate on the first group of amendments tomorrow. Firstly, we intend to merge Health Education England with NHS England and Improvement, putting education and training of our health workforce at the forefront of the NHS. By bringing this vital function inside the NHS, we can plan more effectively for the long term and have clear accountability for delivery. Secondly, we also intend to take forward the recommendations of the Wade Geary report, which includes merging NHSX and NHS Digital with NHS England and Improvement, building on the huge progress made on digital transformation during this pandemic and bringing together the digital leadership of the NHS in one place. I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to all our colleagues at Health Education England, NHS Digital and NHSX for their exceptional work. These changes build on that contribution and allow us to drive forward further integration and changes that will put the NHS on a firmer footing. I hope that I have reassured honourable members of the Government's commitment to improving public health and would urge those who have tabled amendments to consider not pressing them to a division. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I have listened carefully to the debate and I wish to withdraw new clause two. However, I would like to push new clause four to a vote. Yeah. Is it your pleasure that new clause two be withdrawn? Aye. New clause two by, re by leave withdrawn. Uh, new clause four has been selected for separate decision. I call uh, Mary, Mary Kelly Foy to move new clause four formally. Formally. The question is that new clause four be added to the bill. Be, be added to the bill. And read a second time. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. No. That new clause four be read a second time. As many as I've that's been say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. no. Tell us for the ayes, Colleen Fletcher and Liz Twist. Tell us for the no, Steve Double and Michael Tomlinson.
Lock the doors. The eyes to the right, 230. The nose to the left, 297. The eyes to the right, 230. The nose to the left, 297. So the nose have it, the nose have it. Unlock. Order, order. Under the order of the House today, I must now put the questions necessary to bring to a conclusion proceedings on the new clauses and amendments in this group. New Clause 16 has been selected for separate decision, and I call Alex Norris to move New Clause 16 formally. Formally. The question is that New Clause 16 be added to the Bill. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. no. Division, clear the lobby.
Order. Order. The question is that new clause 16 be added to the bill. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. no. Tell us to, for the ayes, Colleen Fletcher and Liz Twist. Tell us for the noes, Steve Double and Michael Tomlinson.
the doors. Order, order. The eyes to the right, 194. The nose to the left, 298. Thank you. The eyes to the right, 194. The nose to the left, 298. So the nose have it, the nose have it. Unlock. We now come to Government Amendments 31 to 39. I call the Minister to move Government Amendments 31 to 39 formally. Beg to move. The question is that Amendments 31 to 39 be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now have to come to Group 2. We begin with Government New Clause 49 with which it will be convenient to consider the other selected new clauses and amendments as listed on the selection paper. I call the Minister Ed Arger to move Government New Clause 48. 49. I, I'm very sorry. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, I almost moved the wrong clause. Um, thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I would like to start with Amendment New Clause 49, which attracts a slightly fuller house than we have for my last um, speech. This adds an additional clause in relation to the cap on care costs for charging purposes. 
On 7 September, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, took the bold step of publishing Build Back Better, our plan for health and adult social care. Reform of social care is an issue that successive governments over decades have failed to tackle. This government is delivering a package, and package is the key, of reforms that will both tackle the wider challenges faced by the adult social care system as well as reform of how social care is funded to ensure that everyone, regardless of where they live or their levels of asset, is protected from catastrophic costs. Let me remove all doubt on this issue. No one will lose from these reforms compared to the system we have now, and the overwhelming majority will win. Underpinning the reforms set out in the plan is an additional $5.4 billion over the next three years. This funding will end wholly unpredictable care costs and include at least £500 million to support the adult social care workforce. The reforms will make a huge difference to the front line. I'll make a little bit of pro- progress and then I'll give way to my right honourable friend. Of course I will. The reforms will make a real difference to the front line of adult social care, including care users and the dedicated care workforce who have performed heroics throughout the pandemic. And a crucial element of those reforms were the proposals to reform the existing social care charging model support. I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way so early in his speech, and I'm glad to hear that he, he, he asserts that uh, no one will lose out and most people will win. Uh, can he then publish an impact assessment uh, that will allow us actually to look at the detailed figures? Because, as he will be aware, there is much commentary about the distribution of the possible losses, and that seems to me an extremely important and sensitive issue for the Government to address. Well, I'm grateful to my right hon. Friend, who takes a very close interest in this um, issue and has long um, done so. I will come on in a moment to some of the figures and some of those changes. I hear what he says about giving the House and the other place the information it needs, and I know that the aim is to do exactly that. At present, can I make a little progress, and then I will give way to my right honourable friend. Um, At present, one in seven adults over 65 face care costs of over £100,000 over their lifetime. We are capping the amount anyone will be forced to spend on personal care costs in their lifetime at £86,000. This is a seismic and historic change in the way we pay for care in England. Yes, I will give way to my own I thank my right honourable friend for giving way. And the government does deserve credit for grasping this nettle, which has evaded governments on both sides of the House for too long. But he must understand that there is real cause on these benches about the distribution of the the relative losses and the worry that those less well-off are going to be hit hardest from the government's amendment tonight. Will he address that issue when he um, gets back to the dispatch box? Well, I'm grateful to my honourable friend, and what I would say to him is I I understand where he's coming from, where honourable members on both sides of this house are coming from. What I would say is that this this is the first major step forward we have seen in reforming social care in in decades, Um, and it must be seen as part of an overall package of changes. The reforms will make... I'd like to make a little progress, if I may, if I may. Um, The reforms will also make the existing means test far more generous. We are increasing the upper capital limit from £23,250 to £100,000. This will make masses of people with moderate assets eligible for some state support towards the cost of care earlier, and the lower capital limit will also increase from £14,250 to £20,000. And Below this level, of course, people only contribute from their income, fully protecting their savings and assets below £20,000. Over recent days, people have compared our policy proposals to previous abandoned, never enacted proposals for reform. I am clear, Madam Deputy Speaker, that our proposals will deliver the changes needed where others have failed and see a significant improvement on the system we have in place today. We have considered what help people want and when they want it. Forgive me, the right honourable gentleman bobbed earlier, and I should have taken it. Very very grateful to the Minister. Uh, Would he confirm that the amount of tax that is going to be raised in the immediate future for national insurance and then in a separate tax is is a relatively small minority of the total costs of public social care? And would he also confirm that none of this addresses the issues of the hotel costs which people need to pay when going into care homes. Well, he's right. the, my right honourable friend is right to highlight that this is talking about the personal care costs, so he's right in, his, uh, in the point he makes on that. Did I see the honourable lady 
rise? Very generous in giving way. Um, a lot of research went into the work by Mr Dilnot uh, some time ago and a, a very independent assessment was made. Could he explain why in this uh, clause he is going to be um, going away from those recommendations and yeah. taking a fresh look at it? Well, the Honourable Lady, and as ever, while we don't always agree on everything, she asks a perfectly reasoned and, and measured question. Um, I pay tribute to the work that Andrew Dilnot did on his report. I just happen to say that on this point, we diverge from what he proposed, and we believe that what we are proposing is the right way forward. We have always intended, we've always intended for the cap to apply to what people personally contribute, rather than on the combination of their personal contribution and that of the state. It will mean people with fewer chargeable assets meet towards the cap more slowly because they are paying much less each week than people who are entirely self-funding. This amendment will both make it simpler to understand the amount that will go towards the cap and make it fairer. And I, if the Shadow Secretary of State will forgive me, the Honourable Lady, the Right Honourable Lady, did, has attempted on a number of occasions to get in, so it's only fair. On, on the point the Minister is making about the Dilmot proposals and a comparison, the Alzheimer's Society has said that 15% of people with dementia in the North West would reach the cap under the Government's proposals compared to 34% who would reach the cap under deal not proposals. That's a massive amount. And those are the people that are paying hundreds of thousands of pounds, they and their families. That's the comparison. Yeah. Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady. I think she posed a question, but she made her, point, um, made her point clearly, as she always does. And again, um, if I may make a little progress, and then I'll give way to my former boss, the former Secretary of State, and if I have time, to my right honourable friend. Let me just make a little progress. Um, to reiterate, as my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, said on the 7th of September, nobody, nobody, Madam Deputy Speaker, will be worse off than under the current system. Currently, around half of all older adults in care receive some state support for their care costs. This will rise to roughly two thirds under these reforms, and this clause would also make a number of minor technical amendments to other sections of the Care Act. Before I give way, I'll give way to the former Secretary of State. Isn't the right way to think about this? change to consider the proposal in front of us compared to the current system yeah. because the reason that the Dilnot system as previously proposed was never put in place was there was a, never a proposal to pay for it whereas this is a package that is paid for and that's why this government's been able to deliver a package where no previous government has been able to. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm grateful to the former, sec former Secretary of State and he is absolutely right Madam Deputy Speaker. We deal in the reality and we should compare this to the reality of the system we have in place now, and what we have proposed here is a system that is, um, that is not only moving us forward, but is actually funded and sustainable. I'll give way and then I'll try briefly. I'm very grateful to our honourable friend for, for giving way. Can you just help me on two short matters? Uh, can he uh, give us an assurance that there will be no adverse impact upon local government financing in relation to this, and that he will talk to the local government association, if necessary, around this regard? And secondly, he said it's part of a package. My right honourable friend referred to the impact assessment. Would he agree it's only fair that we should very least have an impact assessment before, the bill, uh, before this bill completes its passage uh, through both houses? Well, I'm grateful to my right honourable Friend, two points. Yes, um, of course, as we move through this reform process, it's absolutely right. It's vital we work with our partners in the local government associations and local authorities of all political complexions. Um, and in respect of the impact assessment, I do believe it's important that there is an impact assessment that, uh, before this legislation completes its passage, is available. I do give way to, sh to the Shadow Secretary of State. I'm, I'm extremely grateful, and the Minister is showing his typical courtesy in giving way. But I think many across the House are puzzled because. We recall this document that the government placed before the House when it asked the House to endorse the national insurance increase, and indeed many members did endorse the national insurance increase, even though they were breaking a manifesto commitment. And this document actually says uh, it will introduce a care cap and it will deliver a core recommendation of the independent Dilnot Commission. It will be implemented using legislation already in place under the 2014 Act, which introduces the independent Dilnot Commission's social care charging reform, and it goes on to describe this as the new cap. 
So why has the government moved away from the position of just a few months ago that it published ahead of a vote on increasing national insurance and moved to a policy now which disproportionately benefits those with greater assets, which is surely cannot be fair? Yeah. I'm grateful to the Shadow Secretary of State, who, while I don't um, necessarily agree with his perspective, as ever, puts it courteously, um, we hold true to what we put in that Building Back Better document. It is necessary for this one particular element to see further primary legislation, hence the amendment today. I'm afraid I won't because I do need to make some progress. I've been very generous. I've been very generous in my time and to the shadow front bench. So forgive me, no. Forgive me. Not on this point. Um, to reiterate, to reiterate, to reiterate, as my right honourable friend the Prime Minister said on the 7th of September, nobody, nobody will be worse off than under the current system. Currently, around half of all older adults in care, as I say, receive some state support. This will rise to roughly two-thirds under these reforms. In terms of the minor technical amendments to other sections of the Care Act that are made, I wouldn't wish to belabour each one, but I can reassure the House these changes will ensure the legislation works as intended. And everyone who is eligible, I won't. I want to make some more progress. I've, I've given away just, and I want to make a little more progress, and I will be even had. I'm afraid I won't give away either to my own um, side or the honourable lady at this moment. Um, this will be done by amending the provisions to clearly describe the information that must be included in a personal budget so that individual contributions count towards the cap at the local authority determined rate and to ensure that personal budgets and independent personal budgets work as they were originally intended when being used in conjunction with the cap. Madam Deputy Speaker, before turning um, to uh, integrated care boards, I would put on, I would put on record once again, that this must be regarded as part of a package of measures that improve significantly on the current provision in place for uh, those funding care. I'm extremely grateful to my right honourable friend uh, for giving way. Uh, can you just confirm, before we leave the subject of the cap, that this proposal includes the cost of domiciliary care, which had not been included under the original do not proposals that are exercising members opposite? Well, I'm grateful to my right honourable friend for giving me an opportunity to highlight that he's exactly right that this improves in this respect on the Dilnot proposals. I say I put on record my tribute to Andrew Dilnot for his work, but we believe this is a better package and indeed, as the right honourable gentleman highlighted, a sustainable uh, package from a financial perspective. I do, as she, she implores me after six weeks of having to sit opposite me in committee, yeah. uh, the least I can do is let her to intervene. I may <laughs> well and, and, and several times in that committee, I offered to help to the government in, in, in a cross party way. And I think the Minister has been dealt a bad blow here tonight, having to come That's here and yeah. defend this proposal. Yeah. Because yeah. in those six weeks, I think 21 sessions, not one iota of this proposal was mentioned or brought forward. And as we all know, bad legislation, rush legislation, yeah. legislation that doesn't have the commitment on something so important. And I've also commended the government on starting this conversation. is a poor, is a poor legislation move. So so I'm sure the members here would absolutely support the Minister tonight to withdraw this, to go back to the Chancellor and ask him to think again. And we're all behind you, Minister, if you take that opportunity. Madam Deputy Speaker, thank you. I, I wondered whether I might regret the intervention. It was, it was typically, um, typically courteous, although I have to say when a, uh, when a member of the opposition occasionally says, we're here to help you, I'm not always sure. Um, I always take him that to Of course, when the Honourable Lady does it. Um, I know she is sincere about it. Now, the point I would make to the Honourable Lady is that this is an important, uh, but, uh, important change that is necessary to deliver on the pledge we have made. It is being introduced at report stage. I suspect that while ICBs and ICSs, which we will speak about shortly, are hugely important, I suspect that this may dominate debate in this, uh, this group at report stage, and I suspect it will equally be fully debated in the other place and scrutinised there as well. Um, if I may, I, finally, and then I do need to move on. Just on that point, but, uh, would the Minister agree that, this, that we've been on a journey and the context of, of this needs to be thought of in the way that we are starting a conversation, other things will come and there will be bumps in the road, but the context we need to look at this is that this is the first government to tackle the yeah, issue yeah. of yeah. social care yeah. in decades, yeah, yeah. and that's the right way to look at this piece of legislation, and not in short-term, um, not in a short-term way. Yeah. I am grateful to my honourable friend, a member of the uh, Select Committee. He makes the point well that this is another step on a journey, but it's a journey that 
Only this government has actually got round to starting. Previous governments have failed to make that progress. The previous government, uh, the previous Labour government, I think two green papers, one royal commission, and one spending review, and nothing done. So this government is making significant progress. I won't, I'm afraid I've given way to the honourable lady. I won't. I won't again. Um, and I say to the honourable member for Bristol South, um, th I thank her for her her words at the beginning. But I have to say, it is not um, as she characterised it, me having been dealt a difficult or challenging hand this evening. I am. Um, proud to stand here to defend this government being the first government to make changes to tackle the social care challenges this country face. I'm afraid I won't. I've made significant I've given way a number I've given way a number of times. I'm afraid I do want to make I do want to make some progress. I will be winding up the debate so honourable members will have the opportunity to come back in me that I'm afraid not not now. I did give way to the Shadow Secretary of State. So Madam Deputy Madam Deputy Speaker turning to Integrated, turning to, I, turning to integrated care boards. I gave way to my other neighbour in Leicestershire. Integrated care boards and integrated care partnerships, Madam Deputy Speaker. I would remind the House of what my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, said at second reading. These bodies are critical for delivering the key aims of this legislation, reducing bureaucracy, supporting integration and collaboration and improving accountability. At the heart of this legislation for these bodies is flexibility, giving systems the scope to shape structures according to their needs. This principle is widely supported across the NHS and local government, and, why, and we would not want to imperil that. That is why we will be resisting attempts this evening to more tightly constrain how ICBs and ICPs operate. However, we do recognise there are a number of points of clarification that would be helpful to include, and we have brought forward a number of amendments to do just that. Um, amendment 29, um, the question of integrated care boards. Before we reach the meat of this section, there are a number of minor amendments to deal with, if I may. Firstly, I move that minor and technical amendment 29 should stand part of the bill. It updates a reference in the Health and Social Care Community Health and Standards Act 2003 to reflect the changes made to section 99 of the NHS Act. 2006. Amendment 30 in the Secretary of State's name will designate integrated care boards as operators of essential services under the Network and Information Systems Regulations. This will place requirements on ICBs to protect their network and information systems by managing risks in order to ensure service availability and prevent patient harm. We expect ICBs to be taking decisions on IT investment, including around cyber security, and owning systems and the associated cyber risk that are critical to the provision of health care. This includes holding the shared care record. The loss or corruption of data from the shared care record could have clear implications for delivery of care, as well as wider public trust in the digitisation and data sharing agenda. We must take this risk seriously and assure ourselves that ICBs are doing so as well. Currently, yeah, of course I will. I am very grateful. Can I take him back to New Clause 49 very briefly? <laughs> very briefly. Um, he's right to point out some of the measures he's brought forward are more generous than previously proposed. But there is no doubt that the way the cap works for those on, with more modest assets is, is less generous. Would he not agree with that? And how can that be fair? Well, I'm grateful to my honourable friend and for his intervention. Um, I would, I would simply take him back to the point that I made previously, that this, when compared to the current system, is a significant improvement and step forward, particularly when taken in the round with the overall package of measures which see those flaws go from 23,250 up to 100,000 and from 14,250 up to 20,000 pounds. And I think we do have to look at this in the round, considering all those aspects, rather than purely one element Alone. So I'm grateful to him for his intervention, but I hope, um, I hope to be able to move it. I'm afraid I'd like to move on a little bit onto ICBs and ICSs, but as I say, I will be winding up at the end, and assuming there is time, I suspect um, the, uh, the Select Committee Chairman may have the opportunity to come in all to give a speech um, in the course of this debate. Currently, the NIS regulations cover NHS providers in England rather than commissioners. This amendment allows us to mitigate cyber risk in a wider sense making cyber security a responsibility for organisations which have duties across the system and drive forward a shared and collaborative effort towards reducing the risk to patients. Now, I hope that these amendments 
may be uncontentious and supported by both sides of the House. Turning to amendments 26 and 28, um, on ICBs, not on New Clause 49, but on ICBs, which I have moved on to. I would um, ask the Minister if he's absolutely sure what he said in response to the Honourable Gentleman, that everybody would be better off under uh, the last new clause than now. Is it not the case, as illustrated by the Health Foundation, that people with very modest homes worth under £106,000 will never hit the cap and therefore will not be better off under the government's proposed system than they are now. Yeah. Yeah. The point to the honourable lady that I made in my opening remarks, I said no one would be worse off and the majority would be significantly would be better off. That's the point I make to her. They wouldn't be worse off when I if she looks at hands on my original remarks when opening this debate. Um, I will turn to the amendments the government is introducing on the membership of integrated care boards. Firstly amendments twenty six and twenty eight. These amendments are minor and technical and simply make clear that the constitution of an ICB may provide for more than one member to be nominated by NHS trusts and NHS foundation trusts, primary medical service providers or by local authorities. The proposed legislation sets out the minimum membership of the ICB, which needs to include members nominated by these bodies. However, local, local areas can go beyond the legislative minimum requirements in order to address their local needs. We want to make it clear that this includes being able to nominate more than one member from those sectors to sit on the board if that is what is best for their local system. Um, turning on ICBs, but not on where well, we've moved on to, because I do need to make some progress because I know many members want to speak on this. In a way, he has been very, very generous with his time. Would he agree with me that if it, true integration is to be achieved and genuine parity of esteem, it would be written into law that local authorities should have a seat on the ICB. Yeah. I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady, but IC, local authorities will have a seat on ICBs and on the ICP as well. We believe that the approach set out in this legislation is appropriate. We've sought throughout for it to be permissive, not prescriptive, and we believe that that is and remains the right approach. Um, may I make a little bit of progress, and then I may, depending on my time, give way to my right honourable friend, but I am conscious honourable members and right honourable members want to speak, I suspect, on new clause 49 primarily. Um, turning to Amendment 25, and in doing so, I would like to actually thank the Honourable Members for Ellesmere Port, whose birthday it is today, I think, so I wish him happy birthday, um, and I'm sure he can think of nothing he'd prefer to be doing than, than this on his birthday, and Nottingham North for their discussions about this issue and express my gratitude for the helpful spirit in which they entered those conversations. I don't know what view they have reached, but I'm grateful for the spirit in which they approached those discussions. Although service provision, and I would emphasise the word provision by the independent and voluntary sector, has been an important and valuable feature of the system under successive governments, it was never the intention for independent providers to sit on integrated care boards, and it still isn't. We were clear that the conflict of interest um, provisions, despite misleading and inaccurate claims by some campaigners and others, addressed this. However, we are clear, we are happy to put this even beyond, uh, further beyond doubt. The amendment makes clear that no one would be appointed to an ICB who would undermine the independence of the NHS, either as a result of their interests in the private healthcare sector or otherwise. We expect this to prevent, for example, directors of private healthcare companies from sitting on the board of an ICB. It would prevent significant. I'll finish the paragraph and then I'll give way. Um, it would prevent significant stakeholders of private healthcare companies from sitting on the board of an ICB, and it would prevent lobbyists from sitting on those boards. It would prevent anyone with an obvious ideological interest, clearly running counter to the NHS independence, from sitting on the board of an ICB. And I did promise my right honourable friend. Can you just give us some brief comment on the recruitment of chief executives and senior management to, to these boards um, in terms of are we using people who are, have already got NHS senior jobs and therefore not having redundancy and transfer costs, or is there going to be quite a redundancy bill because we want to change personnel? Well, it depends. I mean, if the right honourable gentleman, I think, is talking about executive yeah. posts. Um, yes, there will be processes in place to ensure employment rights are respected. There will be some roles which are completely new and there will be a competition, but I would expect those who have significant track record and experience would therefore find themselves in a strong position. But I'm not going to prejudge any of those individual um, decisions. I'm afraid I'm going to give way to um, the right honourable gentleman behind, if I may, because he was bobbing a little bit earlier. 
Um, not a right honourable, but very happy to take the promotion. <laughs> I have a number of amendments on the order paper today, Minister, and tomorrow around parity of esteem. Technical amendments that are very totemic. So we take general references to health and change them to physical health and mental health. And I hope the Minister will receive those with his usual generosity and make the necessary changes over the course of the next two days. Yeah, yeah. I'm grateful to my honourable friend. Um, I take them in the spirit which, of course, they are intended, and I really recognise the importance and the, the value that both sides of this House put on parity of esteem of mental, uh, mental and physical health. I suspect we may debate his amendments in subsequent groupings, and I look forward to responding. Then, if I may make a little bit of progress, just a little bit. Um, we have, in the process of drafting this amendment, heard suggestions that we should simply ban private company employees completely from the boards of ICBs, and I am afraid that doing so is not so simple, nor would it achieve the desired result in all cases. In fact, our proposed amendment goes further to underline the importance of NHS independence than an amendment which focused purely on banning employees of private providers would. There are clearly some... I will finish my paragraph and I will give way to my hon. Friend from Suffolk. There are clearly some candidates who would be suitable but may have minor interest in private health care, GPs, for example are and have provided their excellent knowledge and experience to their patients in guiding commissioning decisions, and some may have private practices as well. Excluding them would be to lose their experience from the NHS, and so such an involvement with the private sector would clearly not risk undermining the independence of the NHS. I give way to my honourable friend. Thank my uh, honourable friend for giving way and uh, draw the House's attention to my declaration of members' interests of practising NHS doctor. Um, on the issue um, of uh, GPs that he, he raised in his uh, previous comment, uh, a number of GPs um, have uh, in recent times sought to group together into um, confederations of practices um, which could potentially create a block interest within uh, a local uh, board area. Um, could he explain to me how that potential um, conflict of interest in uh, the commissioning uh, and provision of services will be addressed uh, by uh, the government's uh, legislation. Well, to my honourable friend, and he knows, um, he knows of what he speaks in terms of the operation of healthcare services. We wouldn't wish to exclude GPs or groups of GPs from being able to participate in decision making. That expertise we know and we've seen with CCGs can be hugely valuable. What we've sought to do in, in an amendment that is, is technically worded, if you want a better way of putting it, is to try to strike the right balance while also having the, uh, the additional measures by the constitutions of the ICBs and ITPs from having to be approved um, by NHS England to seek to avoid any obvious conflict of interest. But we're not seeking to avoid GPs from being able to operate in that space and to sit on ICBs. I'd like to make a little progress and then I will give way to the right honourable gentleman who's been who has um, who's been bobbing for some time. We believe, uh, and this may, it may not answer the Honourable Gentleman's point, but I'll make a little progress and then if, if there is time, I'll... <laughs> um, well, we'll see. Hope springs eternal. Um, a blanket ban on employees of private companies would also, we fear, be arbitrary. It would not cover the full range of people involved in non-NHS providers, some of whom may not be suitable candidates to sit on ICBs because of their involvement but not employment within the private healthcare sector. The complex corporate structures providers may have established means a narrow definition on the face of the bill could actually be unhelpful and may risk not capturing the people we wish to capture. I give way to my right honourable friend. And then you. Honourable friend for giving way. Can I support what he's saying? It would be a crazy situation to exclude primary care because primary care is effectively private healthcare business. Uh, and so what he's saying is enormously important. But could I also, in, in support of my uh, honourable friend here, say that if I look at my own county, uh, I think it would be absolutely wrong if the Mental Health Trust did not have a presence in the governorship of the, uh, the ICP. And I do hope that as he goes forward, he will ensure that it is not only the conventional trusts uh, in hospitals and in primary care, but the Mental Health Trust that also have a presence because their role is vital and the integration of services is essential to the delivery of good mental health care. Well, I'm grateful to my right honourable friend. He makes a point that actually came out in some of the oral evidence sessions for the bill. Our aim was to create a, um, a minimum membership for the ICB and ITP, but it's not prescriptive. It can go beyond that, and therefore there is entirely scope for, be it Mental Health Trust or other 
health trusts to have seats on those boards. And indeed, we heard from, um, I think it was Dame Jill Morgan, who runs the ICS in uh, Gloucestershire, who said that's exactly what she has done, and she'd be surprised if any ICB did not wish to do it, but we wanted to set a de minimis um, membership to allow that local flexibility. Um, I'll make a little progress, and then I'll give way to the honourable gentleman uh, on the back bench opposite, because I promised him I would. Can I, actually, you know, I'll give way to him now, and then I will. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to the Minister. He is being generous in, in, in giving him way. We have GP practices that are being privatised now. They're being bought up by a private companies, some foreign interests as well. If the Minister is saying that those companies can have uh, re representation on ICBs, in, we've seen circumstances already where people have tried to redact minutes of meetings. So where does this open up the possibility of private interests being served at these meetings but not being accountable through public scrutiny? Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman, and actually I, I entirely understand the point he's, he's making, and I think he was careful, shall we say, given some litigation that may be going on, not to mention anything specific, but I know what he's talking about. We believe that the amendment we are bringing forward would prevent uh, private companies, whatever services they were providing for the NHS, with a significant private interest in this, or their lobbyists, from being able to sit on the um, ICBs. But it's a point that the Honourable Lady Member for Bristol South raised in uh, committee a number of times, I suspect we may return to it, which is the need for transparency. We believe that the current transparency requirements on CCGs, which will be carried across, are sufficient to ensure transparency and public access to the information they need. Um, I, I'm afraid I'm about to conclude, so the Honourable Gentleman, I suspect, will come back in with a speech, and I will endeavour to pick up on that in, in the wind-ups. Madam Deputy Speaker, there are a number of other similar amendments on the order paper, such as Amendment um, 101 in the name of the Honourable Members for Wirral West and Brighton Pavilion. I hope they might feel to some degree reassured by our amendment and the intent behind it. That obviously is for them when they speak to it. We believe that the Government's amendment puts beyond doubt what we believe was already entirely clear, but we were determined to put it beyond doubt that ICBs will not and cannot be controlled in any way by the private sector, that they are the NHS accountable body, they are NHS bodies guided by the NHS constitution and with NHS values at their heart. These principles, I believe, irrespective of other debates we may have this evening, command respect from both sides of this place. And therefore, Madam Deputy Speaker, I commend these amendments to the House. Cap on care costs for charging purposes. The question is that new clause 49 be read a second time. Uh, Shadow Minister Justin Mathers. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I beg to move the amendments in my name and the names of my honourable friends as they appear on the order paper. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, there are a wide range of issues that are part of this grouping which demonstrates, I think, the cold reality of this bill. It is a jumble sale of bits and pieces. Of course, a bill can be wide-ranging, but having breadth is not the same as having coherence or, indeed, clarity. But such are the issues within scope in this grouping alone. I will not comment directly on every new clause and amendment, but hope to have time to say at least a few words on those emanating from the opposition front bench, as well as any government new clauses or amendments that we oppose. Some amendments also refer to matters that have been dealt with in committee where we have expressed our views and put forward amendments but have failed to persuade the Government. So sadly we have insufficient time to go over the same ground again, particularly given the rapid shifting of the goalposts we have seen in the last week. So, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I will turn first to integrated care boards, which for brevity's sake I will uh, refer to as ICBs. Uh, and more widely the issue of governance. The question of governance and accountability remains an important matter to us and needs greater clarity than currently appears on the face of the Bill. For members who may not be familiar with the detail, the Bill proposes yet another reorganisation of the NHS, creating 42 new integrated care systems where decisions on how NHS and care spending will be made. These decision-making bodies within these systems are the ICBs, replacing the CCGs which fall away into the annals of history alongside the PCGs and the PCTs and all the other permutations that we have seen. Our discussions in these, on these matters in committee, I think, showed that our disagreements tended to uh, centre around an intention by government to limit what is in statute and to leave maximum flexibility at a local level, as opposed to a desire from ourselves to ensure that safeguards and protections were in place for those matters we felt were too important to be left out. 
It is, of course, wholly ironic, therefore, that this bill proclaims, on the one hand, local freedoms and flexibilities, yet on the other proposes sweeping top-down powers for NHS England and the Secretary of State. Our review remains that some flexibility is fine to allow shaping to local needs, but also some key principles need to be put on the face of the bill to ensure there are no misunderstandings or unintended consequences. And we know the genesis of this bill has been the realisation that increasingly large parts of the NHS were ignoring the Lansley Act. Along with changes in procurement and pricing, this grouping deals with the main elements reversing parts of that bill. We could, on this side, spend all our time referring to what we said 10 years ago and how the 2012 Act has proved to be the disaster we said it would be, but we will spare the government that we told you so lectures, as even those opposite are now aware that the 2012 Act has been amongst the worst policy mistakes in the history of the NHS. Whether that damage uh, was worse than the damage done by a decade of austerity remains to be seen, but repairing the damage done by austerity is not for today, as there is little in this bill to address the ongoing consequences of a decade of underfunding, particularly in the wholly appalling waiting times that we now see across the board. But returning to the bill, what became clear in committee was that the bill is an NHS reorganisation with little to say on social care. And in fact, until last week at least, it had just two clauses out of 135 on social care. We get one system of procurement replaced by another that resembles Swiss cheese, and on funding flows and pricing, we get nothing in the bill at all. We were originally told that this was a bill for integration, but halfway through its consideration, we were told there will be a white paper along shortly to deal with integration. <laughs> At least that means there is a recognition that this bill is not going to deliver the promised land of integration, if indeed it is the promised land. But in the meantime, the government will expect people to crack on with this reorganisation, taking them away from the day job. At second reading, we said this was the wrong bill at the wrong time. It does not address any of the vital issues currently facing the NHS. And since then, on every metric, the NHS is now performing worse. The challenges have got greater ahead of what is widely expected to be the most difficult winter in the NHS's history. The NHS does not need yet another reorganisation when the fundamental challenges it faces remain untouched. The explanatory notes and impact assessment for this bill are both sketchy at best. For example, we do not know what this reorganisation will cost the NHS, and there is certainly nothing in there about social care caps, but we will return to that later. And then there is a justifiable fear about private sector providers being given a seat on the ICB. Although, I think as the Minister said, there does appear to be a general agreement now that something should be done about that. So this debate is more about the how than the why. And I appreciate uh, the efforts made by the Minister with uh, Amendment 25 in trying to find an accommodation with us and indeed his birthday wishes. Uh, and he's yeah, abs absolutely yeah. right. There is no place I would rather be than in this chamber yeah, tonight yeah, discussing yeah, yeah health and care integration, Madam Deputy Speaker, but I'm afraid we won't be able to support the Government on, on the Amendment 25 because it doesn't go far enough in our opinion. It adds in an unnecessary degree of subjectivity into matters and it's not comprehensive in its coverage. Our Amendments 76, 77 and 78 deal with the issue and limit the possibility for influence by vested interests, especially those of the private for-profit sector. Crucially as well, it closes the door on the possibility that is left open by the Government Amendment to private providers sitting on subcommittees or place-based bodies of the ICB, a problem which is incidentally of the Government's own making by virtue of them leaving the level of direction for place-based government arrangements deliberately vague in the Bill. Was someone to speak? Yes. Um, maybe my honourable friend can illuminate me. I was going to ask the Minister whether the I who owns the assets of the ICBs, whether the ICBs can actually sell some of the assets and rent them back as a service, and what constraints there might be to stop people on the board enabling that, because they've got some strange link to the people buying the assets. Well, um at the moment, ICBs, of course, aren't a, a legal entity, and therefore they don't own anything. And when, when it comes into uh, force, they will effectively, I think, take over uh, mainly administrative buildings from the CCGs, and the trust will hold ownership of most of the um, uh, assets. So we, we hope that there will not be the same uh, uh, risks that is outlined there, although I do believe uh, it's not uh, impossible for ICBs to set up their own trusts at some point in the future. Um, but turning to the uh, question of uh, private providers sitting on the boards, we don't believe that uh, the question of whether they can sit on uh, the place-based boards uh, uh, can be left open in this way because 
This is really about who runs the NHS and what we say is the complete and utter incompatibility between the aims of private companies and what we say should be the aims of the NHS and the ICBs. I can do no better than refer to the evidence of Dr Chan Nagpal from the Bill Committee who identified the concern perfectly. He said, and I quote, we forget at our peril the, va the added value, the accountability, the loyalty and the goodwill that the NHS provides. We really do. I am saying that it does matter. Your local acute trust is not there on a 10-year contract, willing to walk away after two years. It's there for your population. It cannot walk away. And I think those final words sum it up perfectly. Put a company on the board and their interests last as long as a contract, and those interests will, of course, not be the same as the NHS's anyway. Their primary concerns are the shareholders, not the patients. So, with this clear and unanswerable concern about conflicts of interest, we would invite the government to actually withdraw their amendment and support ours. Yeah, yeah. And just go, who goes on the ICB board? We've already had some discussion on that. Apparently, the answer is not the most appropriate people chosen by an independent external process. The answer is not individuals directly accountable to the public. The answer is left to guidance, which, in our view, leaves open the risk that the voices we think need to be heard will slip through the net. Our Amendment 76 deals with this by setting out the requirements for ICB membership. Allocating scarce NHS resources should be robustly debated and will always be political. Tough choices have to be made, so we need people on the ICB who will be there to cover all the necessary interests for the wider good. If members look at what the amendment suggests, then I hope nobody will argue that those interests do not have to have some voice. Public, patients, staff, social care, public health, mental health, which of these can be safely ignored? Which of them has no part to play? And as I've already mentioned, there is a major area of uncertainty because of the complete absence of anything that sets out how the much vaunted place-based commissioning is going to work. Who will sit at the place-based table is, I'm afraid, still completely opaque. The next major area covered in the bill is a further deconstruction of Lansley, the removal of compulsory competitive tendering for clinical services. We've seen the NHS proposals for a provider selection regime to replace the regulations under Section 75. This is to be regarded as a work in progress. So our Amendment 72 covers this issue to reintroduce some safeguards into the way our money is spent. Yeah. Since its inception, the NHS has always relied on some non-NHS providers, the model developed for GPs being an obvious example. But in recent decades, there's been an increase in the use of private providers of acute care, most notably in diagnostics and surgery. But to be clear, on this side of the House, we believe that the NHS should be the default provider of clinical services, and if it is not the only provider, then it should be the predominant provider in ge geographical and services terms. Where a service cannot be provided by a public body because the cap capability or capacity is not there, then there is still, of course, the option to go beyond the NHS itself. But that should be the last resort and never a permanent solution. So our Amendment 72 sets out a clear framework of how we achieve this. We hope with this extra transparency, this extra rigour, it will mean we avoid buying stuff that is unsuitable, that sits in container mountains. We don't buy stuff that doesn't meet specifications. We don't buy stuff made by companies that have no experience, but they're owned by friends and family. In short, we stop the COVID crony gravy train. Yeah. Use of private sector capacity in the COVID emergency turned out, turned out to be a farcical failure. It became very clear very quickly that it was not there to support the NHS. It was there just to make profits. Use of private providers through dodgy deals during the PPE scandal has highlighted the need for greater transparency and greater capacity in the NHS. We can never allow a repeat of what we have seen there. So we need the rigour set out in the amendment to be put into legislation rather than left to guidance. We need to be able to challenge NHS bodies that do not comply, as well as ministers who try and flout the rules. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'll now deal with uh, new clause 49, saving uh, the best or more accurately the worst until last. And because of the way report stage works, it's fallen to me to express our opposition to this rather than my expert colleague, the member for Leicester West, who shares my dis dismay at what has been produced and how it has been presented to us. So let us start with the process. It's wholly wrong to bring such a fundamental change forward as a last minute addition to this bill. This means it cannot be debated properly today. There is no impact assessment, and of course, as we've already heard, it was not discussed in committee at all. In fact, in 22 committee sessions spanning some 50 hours, we never heard mention of this amendment coming forward or discussion on the care cap once. Indeed, when this chamber were busy debating the social care levy, we were beavering away in committee on the bill, oblivious to the fact that it was coming down the track. 
If government can't even get its decision-making processes integrated, what hope is there for integrating <laughs> health and social care? So the aim of the new clause, as we know, is to remove means-tested benefits from the costs that count towards the care cap. As, been, as has been pointed out far and wide from members on both sides, this change adversely impacts some more than others. It is a wholly regressive measure, to say the least, to give support through means testing, but then to penalise people later on for receiving it in the first place. We will vote against this inequity, and I hope many members opposite will vote with us. They should be getting used to broken promises by the Prime Minister by now. And this is a chance to make a point that he should stand by what he says. Sorry, did someone... I thank my honourable friend and neighbour for giving way. Um, would he agree that this is Robin Hood in reverse gear and encourage the members opposite who talk wax lyrical about levering up, particularly in the north? Well, do the right thing on this one. Yeah. Yeah. I thank my honourable friend for his intervention. I think he must have sneaked a uh, look at my speech because I indeed do say this is Robin Hood in reverse later on. Uh, yeah. I did wait. It's an obvious point. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I would, my honourable friend, to say that this is grossly unfair. I gave the example earlier. In our region, 15% of people with dementia will reach the cap compared to 34% they would have done under the Dillon proposal. But the other thing is that the cap does not protect working age adults with, a, with a, uh, yeah. accessing social care. It does not protect all those people with a disability. Sir Andrew Dillnott's proposal would have done so. So it's the second major area in which this is a grossly unfair proposal. Yeah. 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 I thank my honourable friend for the intervention. Again, I think she must have, must have read my, my speech because, again, that's a point I will be making later on. I think what it shows, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that this isn't a plan to fix social care. It's a very, very thin uh, attempt at trying to uh, change parts of the system. There are many, many other elements of this which clearly need dealing with. Um, but going back to what this clause will do, in case members opposite need reminding, in the Prime Minister's first speech on taking office, he promised to fix the crisis in social care once and for all with a clear plan that we have prepared. We have still to see that plan what we have got is a new tax and a broken promise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I thank my friend and neighbour for giving way. He's making an excellent speech. But I just want to be clear that what we should be talking about is a plan for social care, but what we're actually talking about is a tax on the very people who've lost out yeah. over the past decade or more of the excessive house price growth in the South compared to other parts of the country. Isn't that what we're talking about? A tax that doubles down on inequality, not addresses it. Yeah. Thank my honourable friend and neighbour. I'm getting, getting all the, uh, the neighbours in tonight and she's made an absolutely <laughs> brilliant point that actually uh, this is about regional inequalities being exacerbated by an unfair tax. And it's certainly not a plan to fix social care. If, if members want to look at what my honourable friend, the member for Leicester West, has said about what needs to be done to tackle the social care crisis in this country, we know it's an awful lot more than putting in a cap for some people that benefits only certain parts of the country. So not only will this proposal not stop people from having to sell homes to pay for their costs, it will bake in unfairness for a generation. It does nothing for working adults with long-term care needs, as my honourable friend for Worsley and Eccles South said. They seem to have been completely missed out altogether. This wasn't what was promised, but don't take my word for it. Listen to what the experts say. Age UK said the proposal is, and I quote, makes the overall scheme a lot less helpful to older people with modest assets than anyone had expected. It waters down Sir Andrew Dillnott's original proposal to save the government some money, but at the cost of protecting the finances of older home owners. And just for good measure, Age UK also said, this feels like completely the wrong policy choice, and we are extremely disappointed that the government has made it. The King's Fund said that for those with more modest assets, that the Prime Minister's promise that no one needs sell their house to pay for care doesn't seem to apply to them, but it will instead only benefit wealthier people. And Sir Andrew Dunnott. Yep, yep. I'm grateful to him. He, he referenced the Prime Minister's statement that nobody would have to sell their house to pay for social care. Um, and I know he would never in this chamber, Madam Deputy Speaker, seek to call the Prime Minister a liar. 
but does he wonder, as many of us do, why this bill appears to be turning the Prime Minister's words into a lie? <laughs> thank my, uh, honor I think I thank my honourable friend for his um, uh, uh, intervention there. Yes, uh, yes. What, what I could say in here, what I might say outside, are not not the same. And I do have to finish my speech, so I think we will leave <laughs> leave that there. But I'm sure that uh, the public will make their own minds up about the veracity or otherwise of comments made by the Prime Minister. So, turning to Sir Andrew Dunnott's comments. He said that these proposals will create a north-south divide. He said those with assets of £106,000 will be hardest hit, and anyone with assets under £186,000 will be worse off than under his proposals. According to the Health Foundation, assuming care costs of around £500 a week, those with assets of £150,000 will take a year and a half longer to reach the cap than they would have done under the deal not proposals. Those with assets of £125,000 will take four and a half years longer, than the, and those with assets of under £106,000 will never reach the care cap. Contrary to what the Minister has said, those people with assets of only £106,000 or less will not benefit at all from this proposal. And the Dilnock Commission specifically said excluding state contributions from the cap would be unfair for those on lower incomes and would mean that they would contribute the same as the wealthy just over a longer period. But that is where we find ourselves today with this amendment. Ordinary people on modest incomes are paying an extra tax that doesn't actually stop them having to sell their home to pay for their care costs, but it will mean that the mansions dwelling millionaires will be able to keep theirs. As my honourable friend for Weaver Vale said, we have a reverse Robin Hood here. People on lower incomes will be paying into a system that they will see little benefit from, but it will protect 90% of a property worth a million pounds. And just in case members need some help translating what this means to their constituents, here are a selection of median house prices in various constituencies around the country, all of whom would probably have to sell their homes under these plans. Hartlepool, £128,000. Bishop Auckland, £125,000. Blackpool South, £114,000. Stoke-on-Trent Central, £112,000. Hindburn, £110,000. Burnley, £99,000. Those figures are replicated across huge areas of the country. This isn't just a few people in those constituencies who will lose out. It's thousands of people in each constituency, mainly in the Midlands and the north of England, who will be forced to sell their homes while those in the more affluent areas of the country will get to keep theirs. That's not fairness. That's not fixing social care. That is a betrayal. Yeah. We, on this side of the chamber, always thought levelling up was just a slogan with little substance to it. But now we actually know it's worse than that. It is, in fact, a con trick. It's a lie that will leave many of those who were meant to be supporting worse off than they would be otherwise. And all those members opposite who loyally trooped through the lobbies in September to impose a social care levy, knowing it would disproportionately impact their less well-off constituents when paying into it, must now, to use a phrase we've heard a lot in the last week, be suffering from buyer's remorse. Because it must have dawned on them by now that they have been sold a pup, that there is no plan to fix social care, that this bill won't stop people having to sell their homes, and the only people it will help are already those who are comfortably well off. So the only way they can represent their constituents, constituents who voted for them because they believed that the Conservative Party had changed, that it was at last on the side of ordinary people, is by joining us in the lobbies to vote against the government and show that they won't stand for a government that breaks its promises. Because when the chickens come home to roost and families in their constituency say to members opposite, we were promised that we wouldn't have to sell our homes to pay for care costs, what will they say? Will they tell them that when they voted for this, they did so even though they knew that that was what would happen? Will they tell them that promises made don't really matter? Or will they tell them that when it came to the crunch, they stood up for what is right, what is in the interests of the people they were elected to represent, and they said to government, no, think again? And finally, I would remind members opposite of the manifesto they stood on, which said clearly and unambiguously in respect of social care that... The prerequisite of any solution will be a guarantee that no one needing care has to sell their home to pay for it. If they do not think the government amendment gives that guarantee, that it breaks that promise they made to the electorate, 
that they should join us in the lobbies, take back control and vote against it. Yeah. 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 Order, before I call the next speaker, it will be very obvious there are a large number of colleagues who want to contribute to this debate, and I would really therefore urge brevity to allow others to participate. Chair of the Health Select Committee, Jeremy Hunt. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I think on this occasion I can oblige you because I will be very brief. I wish to speak to Amendment 114, which uh, may seem a rather technical amendment, as evidenced by the fact that out of 650 colleagues, only one has actually signed this amendment, and that is me. Um, but it is actually an amendment that makes up in quality what it doesn't have in quantity, because it is about making sure the new integrated care boards focus their energy on the safety and quality of care of patients. And this is very, very important because the new integrated care boards will have enormous power. They will effectively be the local governing body of our NHS. And so although the statutory structures matter, what the people running those care boards are focusing their attention on is incredibly important to all of our constituents. And as they consider what their priorities are, this amendment makes sure that the things that matter to patients, the safety and quality of care, are at the very top of their list. Now, we know the way the NHS works, the fifth largest bureaucracy in the world. There are a plethora of and internal NHS candidates. I see the Minister wants to give way. Could I ask him if I could just make my argument for one moment and then I will, uh, and then I will give way. There are a plethora of internal NHS targets um, and there are operational targets and there are financial targets. We know that they often have an excellent purpose but also in the case of mid-staffs and other things that went badly wrong, what can happen is that under a lot of pressure to meet those targets, uh, corners can be cut and the quality of care experienced by patients can be really damaged. And so what this amendment does is make sure there is a discipline in the system so that whatever the pressure NHS managers are under, they are always focused on the safety and quality of care. Now we have, um, I give away briefly to my right honourable friend. Very grateful. I pay tribute to what he did as former Secretary of State to stress the importance of this crucial work, and he's not on his own. I support him. Thank you very much. And um, before I come to the Minister, I just want to say that I think the one, I'm very grateful to my right honourable friend who gave me consistent support as Health Secretary on this agenda. In the public sector, the one system that has seemed to make sure that we focus public bodies on the same priorities as our constituents care about <coughs> is the Ofsted system in schools. We have rolled that out, I think, reasonably successfully to hospitals, GP surgeries and care homes. This amendment makes that possible for the new integrated care boards. And I want now to give the Minister a chance to intervene uh, to tell us upon his reflections as to whether this system could work. Well, I'm grateful to my right honourable friend, and can I say that it isn't just him and my right-hand friend, I and the government support him in this, and we are delighted to accept his amendment. Well, I'm most grateful to my honourable friend for that. I'm also grateful to the opposition who've indicated they won't oppose this. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, yes, I give way to my honourable friend. Now that that one's sorted, <laughs> would he offer his, the House his views on new clause 49? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm happy to, to do that because I know my honourable friend has a great interest in social care issues. And my, my reflection, I, I feel conflicted by News Clause 49 because I think that what we will end up with after this is a whole lot better for people on low incomes than what we had before because the means test threshold is raised from £23,000 to £100,000. So I think that is a very, very significant yeah. improvement. However, I have to be honest and say it is nothing like as progressive as we had hoped for, but I do think it is a step forward. My concern is that when it comes to social care, our entire debate is focusing on what contributions do and don't contribute to the cap, 
yeah. when the fundamental problem in social care is the core funding to local authorities, which is not a matter yeah, for this yeah. bill, but actually has a direct impact on the care received by our constituents. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm going to conclude my comments there by thanking the Government for its support for Amendment 114. I will move it formally later, but I'm not expecting to divide the House on it. Dr Philip of Whitford. Um, thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I initially want to touch on new clause 49 as, like other members of the Bill Committee, having sat through hours and hours and hours from September to November, that this is suddenly pounced at the last minute when it is such a complicated new clause and has not been interrogated. It is quite clear that the government's original spin that no one would pay more than £86,000 for social care and no one would have to sell their house is completely misleading. All the accommodation costs are on top of this. As has been highlighted in the media and by members in the Chamber, those with assets of about £100,000 will not see any real gain from this policy, while those sitting on assets of half a million or more will keep a lot of their wealth. That means it exacerbates the differences and penalises those in the north of England and areas where house values are not so high and basically is feeding the frenzy down here of people sitting on overinflated house prices. As has been said, not levelling up, just doubling down. The cap only applies to personal care. This means things like washing and dressing which has been provided free in Scotland, both within the care home and in home care since 2002, was expanded in 2011 to provide more hours so people with greater need could stay at home longer, and was extended to those under 65 with care needs in April 2019. Scotland's the only UK nation that provides free personal care, and we see it as an investment an investment that we spend 43% more per head on social care in Scotland, but an investment in people's independence and their inclusion in society. The problem is we spend far too much time talking about social care just as a burden, instead of actually seeing it from the point of view of the user. The Scottish Government already added an extra penny on taxation for medium and high earners to cover things like our well-being policies or health or social care. But this government's plan to increase national insurance contributions will disproportionately hit low-paid workers and young workers. And I would say the biggest weakness of all that we know from the original debate on the national insurance change is that the funding is not going to go to social care initially. It's going to go to the NHS, and yet it's social care that is in crisis. This is what's causing the pressure in accident and emergency, because people who are ready to be discharged simply can't be, as the care support isn't there. So I don't think that this fixes the problem. There will actually be very little money, because a lot of it's going to go on capping the, the overall payment. I don't see social care benefiting from this at all and yet it's social care that needs investment more than anything else. Turning to the main substance of this bill, which is meant to, to some extent, unpick the damage and fragmentation of the Health and Social Care Act less than a decade on, I wish to express support for Amendment 9 and Amendment 72. Many in the NHS, including myself, will be glad to see the back of Section 75 and forced tendering Others in this chamber know that it was the Health and Social Care Act that brought me into politics, as I just couldn't believe anybody thought what they were doing was a good idea. But it is still clear from the pandemic that this government are absolutely wedded to outsourcing services to private companies and to the flawed notion that somehow financial competition drives up clinical quality. I'm sorry, that just simply isn't the case. As the Chair of the Health Select Committee has just highlighted, you actually have to focus on safety, on clinical audit, on peer review, if you want to drive up care quality for patients, not just the money that's in the system. 
The government appeared to have conceded that integrated care boards should be statutory bodies, as health boards have always been in Scotland. But the partnership boards can include private providers, such as we see with Virgin Care in Bath. As the partnership boards will be involved in devising the local strategy for health services, this is likely to lead to a blatant conflict of interest, and I do not see any resolution to that. The NHS simply should be the presumed provider of health services, not just as the Shadow Health Minister has said, because the NHS is in it for the long term, not just for a quick contract. But it's the NHS that provides the training to nurses and doctors who are the vital workforce of the future. Private providers, frankly, don't do that. Private providers largely live off the NHS, as well as not training staff. Patients where there are major problems or complications inevitably end up in the intensive care unit of an NHS hospital. So, in closing, for all the size of the bill, and the scale that this reorganisation will still be for staff in the NHS, who we all know are frankly exhausted, the government have failed to take the opportunity to repair fully the damage of the Health and Social Care Act and to recreate in England a unified public health system as we're lucky enough still to have in Scotland. Anne-Marie Morris. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. First of all, might I take the opportunity to thank the Minister for the time that he's given me to consider my amendments, which we've discussed in some detail, and indeed for Her Majesty's uh, opposition, who very kindly during committee stage took some of my amendments, uh, sadly unsuccessfully, uh, through, the, uh, through the process. But I hope tonight to have the opportunity to explain myself why these amendments are so important. And before the House thinks, oh my goodness, how can we possibly deal with that many clauses um, at amendments, I will endeavour to be brief. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, I rise to speak to new clause 33, amendment 21 to clause 15, and amendments 22, 19, 16, 17, 20, 18, and 23 to clause 19. But I will be brief. Let me then divide this into four topic areas, if I may, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Domestic abuse, mental health, access to medicines, uh, and finally research. So, if I may, uh, I will address new clause 33 on uh, domestic abuse. This is a horrific crime. It's insidious and it's hidden and it's on the rise. And during this pandemic, it has grown sadly from strength to strength. And I say pointedly, this is a hidden crime. And at the moment, all the teeth are with the police, but police can only deal with very evident crime. Where is it that domestic abuse first appears? It is in doctor surgery. It is in accident and emergency. But to date, there is no obligation on CCGs, ICBs, hospitals to actually come up with a strategy to address this horrific, horrific ill. And that is the purpose of this clause, to make sure that there is a new obligation on ICBs to put in place a proactive strategy to properly manage, to introduce the education and training that the GPs, that, the, that those in hospitals in ANAE need to ensure we don't find any longer a safe lives report, that those experiencing domestic abuse would experience for three years before it's picked up, despite having already been to visit their GPs almost five times. I do not believe in a civilised society as we have today, that is acceptable. 5.5% uh, of adults between 16 and 74 experience this sort of abuse. We know that the cost, as Home Office have actually um, determined, uh, was 66 billion uh, in 2016-17, uh, and of that, 2.3 billion was a cost of health service. We know that 23% of those who are at risk attend A and E, and yet nothing, nothing happens. I am fortunate. In Devon, we have a pilot. My CCG in Devon is the only one in the country who has a dedicated individual on the board who specifically oversees and sets a dedicated strategy on this. And the estimate on the pilot so far 
reckons that if we spent 450,000 a year uh, on our GPs in Devon, we would get a return of seven million. But this is not about money. This is about what is the right thing to do. And until this is on the statute books, until there is an obligation to put in place a strategy, this will not change. And I cannot sit here and accept that. Let me move then to mental health. For many years and in many, and in many uh, documents, uh, we see a commitment to parity of esteem. But I have been through every statute on the book and there is at no point any reference to the word parity of esteem for mental health. If we truly believe in parity of esteem for mental health, if it is not on the statute books, how can we say we believe in it? If it is not on the statute books, how can we possibly measure it? Currently, there is no measure. Currently, there are very few measures of inputs, outputs, or worse, outcomes of those going through the mental health system. Yes, there are some, but they are minuscule. They are tiny compared to what we have for physical. So what this clause would require, as amended, would be for each ICB to compare the inputs and outputs on the both, both physical health and mental health. So it would require each ICB to set out the number of patients presenting both physical and mental symptoms. Then it would set out what the waiting times were for initial assessment, for physical health, and for mental health. Then it would set out what are the waiting times for the actual treatment for physical health and mental health. Then it would set out the number of patients actually receiving treatment, physical and mental. And then finally, it would require reports on readmissions. Now, I know that ministers uh, do not like that level of detail, but then how important is this? Without some very specific measures, this will not happen. What gets measured generally gets done. My clause would also require uh, the ICBs to report uh, on the, the, the very few national standards that there are, and at least then we would see what they were. We would shine a bright light on the fact that there were so few for mental health, while there are numerous for physical health. The Secretary of State would be required to consolidate that into a national report which would have to be presented to Parliament, both in the Commons and in the Lords. What is there, Minister, not to like about that clause? What is there? on the opposition benches, not to like. And then I would like to see you wish to put this to the vote and put your vote and your feet where your mouth is. Let me then turn, if I may, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I apologise. It is not your mouth. It is absolutely. I apologise. I was carried away by such a such, a, uh, such an overwhelming desire to get my point across, and I do apologise most profoundly. Access to medicines. Most of, most of the members of the House believe that medicines which have been approved by NICE are available to all our constituents. Don't you? Don't you, all of you members? You do. Uh, so apologies, I've done it again. Don't they? Uh, the reality is they are not. Because despite the fact they've gone through MHRA and they have proved to be safe, despite the fact they've gone through NICE, which effectively says that they are cost effective. What happens is that each now CCG to be ICB and then each hospital trust and each other uh, NHS body responsible for prescribing sets its own formulary. And those formularies do not include all nice drugs. If it is not on the formulary, then any uh, consultant, any GP will not be able to get reimbursement. Therefore, they will not be allowed to prescribe it. I have found in my constituency a number of individuals come to me because they cannot get access to a particular medicine, and yet in another constituency they can. I do not believe that a postcode lottery is right. We all talk about NHS and health and care being free at the point of delivery, and we all assume that we can get access, whether it's GPs, hospitals, but I don't think it occurs to most of us, it hadn't occurred to me, 
but you can't get access to medicines. So, my amendment 21 to clause 15 effectively provides that there should be an obligation on every ICB to provide to any individual patient who has the advice of their clinician that this is the medicine they should have and it has been approved by NICE that they should make provision to ensure it is provided, maybe from a neighbouring ICB, take advantage of the duty to collaborate across ICBs. But that would ensure, even if it wasn't on the formulary in the particular area of an individual ICB, it could be obtained from another area. Now, bear in mind that there is no financial loss to doing this, because all nice approved drugs are subject to an agreement, a voluntary pricing agreement, between the pharmaceutical companies and NHS England. And under that agreement, effectively, X number of these drugs will be provided at an agreed cost. Anything above that, effectively, will get reimbursed by the drug company. So the, so the government and the NHS will not be out of pocket. So why, why would this not be a good clause? And just to give belt and braces, I have suggested uh, amendments 20 and 22, and under those amendments, all nice treatments would automatically be added to all of those formularies within 28 days of marketing authority, and every ICB would be obligated to report. Madam Deputy Speaker, my last area, I will be very brief, research. But research is so important, as we have discovered during the pandemic. And I'd like to draw your attention to some of the challenges, some of the uh, antiviral um, solutions to uh, uh, coronavirus were late to market. They were late to market because we could not get the clinical trials. Why could we not get the clinical trials? Because we could not get access to the, the records of the patients who had had um, COVID and therefore or, or, or had been diagnosed with COVID so that we then had the appropriate cohort on which to be able to, to, to test, if you like, these antivirals. And so it seems to me that it is very clear that research has to be something that we take on board across every hospital trust, across every ICB. This is something which if, we, if every ICB and every hospital trust had in place a system to ensure research was part of the DNA, that they had to report on what research they were, they were undertaking, had an obligation to, if they were asked and if they had the appropriate uh, cohort, that they would then recruit um, the, the patient base so that particular clinical trials could take place, we would get more medicines faster to market. And I think most would say that was a win. So I will. I thank the Honourable Lady for giving way. I'll declare an interest, Madam Deputy Speaker, that my, my partner is a clinical research nurse. Uh, and, and so I completely uh, appreciate and understand exactly where the Honourable Lady is coming from. Uh, does she uh, agree with me that? that these studies that are going on, um, my partner works in, in cardiac research, these studies are going on, in order to find patients for these studies, they're often paying tens of thousands of pounds in radio adverts and online adverts just to find these people. And if her amendment 17 is successful, it could be revolutionary for, for uh, research in this country. Uh, I thank the Honourable Gentleman, he is absolutely right. Uh, if we could have this new system, so there was a research strategy, we did have an obligation to consider these clinical trial requests, and we did then report, then we would be in a very different place. And Madam Deputy Speaker, you have been incredibly indulgent, and so have uh, the honourable members. So upon that note, having had my, uh, uh, my time for my four areas, I thank uh, the House for its indulgence, and I look forward to the Minister's reply. Margaret Greenwood. Thank you, Madam yeah. Deputy Speaker. This bill opens the NHS up to big business, allowing private companies a say in the care that patients can receive. The Government's amendment to the makeup of integrated care boards is weak, and it fails to rule out the possibility of people with interest in private health from sitting on them. For this reason, I have tabled Amendment 101, which seeks to ensure that ICBs are made up wholly of representatives from public sector organisations and that private companies, their employees and representatives, and those with financial interest in them, are not represented on them. Surely this is what the public expects from a body that will be responsible for spending huge amounts of public money. But the influence of private companies isn't just an issue with ICBs. The bill allows for private companies to play parts in other ways. For example, a subsystem level via place-based partnerships and provider collaboratives. 
Guidance by NHS, even though it's, they're not actually stated in the bill, but, that, but that's what it means. Guidance by NHS England states very clearly that the Health and Care Bill, if enacted, will enable IC, ICBs to delegate functions to providers, including, for example, devolving budgets to provider collaboratives. There's nothing to stop such partnerships from being open to big business. So the government's rhetoric around protecting independence of ICBs is frankly quite meaningless. And for all of their talk of recognising that the involvement of the private sector in all its forms in ICBs is a matter of con significant concern to members of the House, they haven't actually taken the, the action needed to stop private companies from influencing decision making. And that is why I've put forward Amendment 58, which is designed to ensure that any organisation carrying out the functions of an ICB on its behalf is a statutory NHS body. While the government has made some noise about private membership of integrated care boards, when it comes to integrated care partnerships, they have said that they want to, quote, uh, want local areas to be able to appoint members as they think appropriate. This, too, is a matter of great concerns. ICPs are required to prepare a strategy setting out how the assessed needs in relation to its area are to be met, and integrated care boards must have regard to this strategy. And so we see ICBs will need to have regard to a strategy drawn up, drawn up by the ICP, which may well be influenced by private companies who do not have the same objectives as the NHS. That's why I, temple, uh, uh, I tabled Amendment 100, which does for ICPs what my Amendment 101 does for ICBs, namely seeks to ensure that integrated car, pe, ca, care partnerships are made up wholly of representatives from public sector organisations and that private companies are not represented on them. The bill breaks the NHS up into a 42 integrated care systems. My Amendment 59 is designed to ensure that any providers of health service cannot withhold provision of those services from any individual because of the integrated care board that they've been allocated to. In other words, that wherever someone falls ill in England, they can get treated. There have been alarming reports recently of people who are in need of urgent care being turned away from A&E because they presented at an A&E centre which wasn't closest to where they live. This is extraordinary and not what we expect of the National Health Service. One recent report told of a woman who suffered burns um, when she, and attended A&E only to be told that the hospital didn't treat people from Rochdale. This is, there is nothing in the bill to ensure that people in the country can go to any A&E in the country if they need to. So my amendment is designed to address this shortcoming. Um, the bill also, as we know, is one about enabling privatisation, and when we look at the procurement reforms in the bill, we can see why. They will enable the removal of the current procurement rules, which apply for NHS and public health service commissioners when arranging clinical, clinical health care services. The bill provides the power to create a separate procurement regime for these services, which will include removing the procurement of health care services for the purposes of the health service from scope of the Public Contracts Regulation 2015. I will indeed. I'm grateful to my honourable friend. Does my honourable friend agree with me that this has the sense of an NHS corporate takeover bill? Um, it, we've already seen, because of the private sector, <coughs> £5 billion in contracts awarded to private companies through the VIP lane. And this bill opens the door to private corporations to sit on 42 local health boards, and this is wrong. Um, I thank my honourable friend for putting the case so clearly. She is absolutely right. She hits the nail absolutely on the head. As a result of the arrangements in this bill, contracts could be handed out to the private sector without the stringent arrangements one would expect in the awarding of public money. This is a recipe for cronyism, the kind that has become all too familiar, as, as my honourable friend has just um, talked about. And now I'd like to turn to the issue of cap on care costs. I was proud to stand on a manifesto in 2019 that pledged to build a comprehensive national care service for England to include free personal care, beginning with investments to ensure that older people have their personal care needs met, with the ambition to extend this provision to all working age adults. The Conservative manifesto in 2019 didn't go that far, but it did at least make the guarantee that nobody needing care would have to sell their home to pay for it. We now know that that was a sham, another broken promise by this government. Last week, ministers snuck out changes to social care plans which would mean poorer pensioners would not, after all, be able to count means-tested payments by the state of their care towards a total cap of £86,000 for any individual. 
The chair of the Health and Social Care Select Committee described it as deeply disappointing that the new plans were not as progressive as those put forward by Andrew Dillnott, the economist who drew up the original plans for a cap on individual contributions. Mr Dillnott has said that the government's plan was a big change and that it, it finds savings exclusively from the well -off, less well-off group. A former Conservative Cabinet Minister has urged the Government to adopt a different approach. Another Conservative MP, a former Under Secretary of State for Health Services, has said that it will be po poorer pensioners who have relatively modest assets that will be most affected by these changes. So I hope that the members on the Government benches listen to these points from their own side, not just from the, us on this side, and that they, they do the right thing. Elderly people deserve better, and all members, including those opposite, have a responsibility to vote these measures down. When the Prime Minister was discharged from hospital in April 2020, having spent seven nights there, three of those in intensive care, he said, the NHS has saved my life, now question. Now he and his government should save the NHS by withdrawing this health and care bill. The National Health Service is this country's finest social achievement, and it is devastating that this Conservative government is intent on taking it off us. Matt Hancock. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise to support new clause uh, 49 um, because I support the action that's needed to make reforms to social care in this country that are long overdue. And I've listened carefully to the debate about new clause 49, and I think that it is vital that we understand that what we're voting on tonight in new clause 49 is to deliver one part, but not the whole, of the package that was set out by the Government in September. And there is no doubt at all that that package as a whole improves the provision of social care and makes fairer the way that it's paid for and removes some injustices that have existed in the, in the, in the system for far too long. First of all, the proposal put forward and I think it's the right proposal, Madam Deputy Speaker, is for a cap on the costs that individuals face in paying for their care. The contributions from the state, even if they're from another part of the state, like from local government, are not individuals' care costs. And therefore, it is wrong that they should contribute towards the cap. The cap is a stated goal of being a cap on the cost to an individual of care, not a cap on the cost that accrues to both the individual and a local authority. Let's look at what would happen if this amendment didn't go through. Firstly, the provision of care by local authorities is different in different areas, largely according to how well off that local authority is. For a richer council, which pays more costs than the statutory minimum as set out in the 2014 Care Act. That richer council would help local residents to meet the cap sooner than a poorer council, which pays only the statutory minimum of care costs. And therefore, people who live in poorer areas would take longer to reach the cap. So we would end up, in effect, with a postcode lottery cap in which people from poorer areas would tend to have to contribute more. That is wrong, and I'm very glad that this is put right in the proposals that are in front of us today. The second reason is that for those who have lower asset values, the rise in the floor in the means testing is more important. And it is the rise in the means test that makes this system fair. And when the shadow minister read out a long list of places that have low asset values on average, house prices tend to be lower, he is list listing out exactly the areas that will benefit most from the rise in the floor, from the rise in the floor. And we can see what the Labour Party are doing. We can see what they're doing. They are taking a narrow area and they are taking a specific detail and they are ignoring all of the parts of the package that benefit the people who will benefit from this package as a Order! Whole. Order! We're not going to get anywhere if people shout. This is supposed to be a reasonable discussion. Thank you. Matt Hancock. Deputy Speaker, because the, the further point, in addition to these, 
that is being ignored by those who are trying to make a meal of this new clause is that the cutting of the daily cost offset is much more valuable to those on low incomes than any change to the cap because the cap by its nature is there for a protection of assets but if you don't have many assets you get far more benefit from the cut in the daily cost offset that would otherwise clock up your uh, your contributions to the cap much more slowly taken together this is a package that is beneficial to those on low incomes it helps to make the system fairer and my final point on new clause uh, 49 is this. For years and years and years, including the three years when I was Secretary of State and including the entire 13 years when the party opposite was in power, nobody fixed the problem of social care. This Government has come forward with a package, but if you pull apart one part of the package, there is a risk of, of the package as a whole. And as Sir Andrew Dilnot said this morning on the radio, the whole package is a significant step Forward. It is always easy in politics and in life to say, I just accept the bits of the package I like. And they tend, when it's the Labour Party, they tend to be, I accept the bits that are very expensive to taxpayers, by the way. Instead, we must look at the package as a whole, which is funded and which is being able to be delivered for the first time in several decades because it comes and hangs together. The government brought forward a whole package, and it is the best possible option in the, in the fiscal constrained times that we, in which we live, and I'll give way. And, and, I'm sorry to be unhelpful to my right honourable friend, but if this element is so integral to the overall package, why wasn't it brought forward right at the beginning? This, this part of the package was, was described in, in September because it was made clear in September that the £86,000 cap was a cap on individual costs. It didn't say then that, it was a, that that included the cost that a local government might make on somebody's behalf. And it's, I think, a strong Conservative principle that when we say we're capping the costs that an individual pays, we don't include the costs that another part of the state uh, should pay. So I think that it was clear, more details have been set out, but most importantly, this is a package which takes things forward in a way that hasn't been achieved for decades. If I, and I'll happily give way. I thank my right honourable friend for giving way. I don't think anyone across the House is, is going to argue that the measures that have been put forward are a significant step forward from where we actually are. But as mentioned by our honourable friend from Thurston Moulton and indeed the right honourable member for, for South West Surrey earlier on, they're not necessarily exactly what we may have been led to expect was coming. So I wonder if he might give comment on that. I happily give way because uh, give a comment on that because many people in the debate in the last few days have been comparing the package put forward by the government with the proposals from Sir Andrew Dilnot in 2014-2015. But there's a reason that those proposals were never enacted. There's a reason they never came into force. It's because they had a huge price tag and there was no successful debate on how to pay for them. And it's been easy to ask for social care reform for the last two or three decades, but nobody until this government uh, did it has come forward with how to pay for them. And you simply can't magic things out of thin air. If you're a grown-up government, you have to come forward with a grown-up package which includes how they're paid for. And that's what has happened. And that's why this package hangs together and we should support this new clause because it is part of that overall funded package. If I may turn very briefly, Madam Deputy Speaker, to the ICS measures too. The purpose of the ICS is, is to have more preventative, less siloed, more flexible approach uh, than under current CCGs without removing the grit in the oyster, which is the purchaser-provider split, and without upsetting the 1948 settlement be between local authorities doing social care and a national uh, NHS. Uh, the amendments that are put forward, in particular Amendment 76, has a lot of suggestions in it which may seem tempting that there are people who have an important voice in the in the debate the problem is as we have seen with existing legislation which has already been referred to if you put too much into statute it's far harder to actually deliver high quality services that are integrated on the ground and that's why the government is resist is right to resist putting too much detail into legislation but i do support the change from the government uh, that says uh, that that makes clear 
that the purpose of ICS is, is not to have private providers on the board. I can confirm, as the Minister said, it never was. There were some mischievous rumours put about, some of which we have heard repeated today, that that was the intention, and I am glad that the Government's uh, amendment puts that beyond doubt. And finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, if I can just say that I am attracted to amendments 89 and 90, and indeed in another group, uh, 91 to 98, and amendment 23 put forward by my, my honourable friend uh, for, um, uh, uh, for Brotspawn. I was going to say this even with, without knowing I was going to be sitting next to him uh, for this debate, uh, and I hope that the Government will look on these uh, kindly. Um, because, the, because the parity of esteem between mental and, and physical health is incredibly important, and I well, commend those to the House. It will be obvious to the House that a lot of people wish to speak. There are a lot of amendments still to be spoken to, and we have an hour left. So I am going to impose a time limit immediately uh, of four minutes. And I do apologise to the honourable gentleman for not. Uh, having given him notice that he's only got four minutes, but I'm sure he'll manage. Peter Dowd. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'll speak to my amendments one and two, which are primarily in relation to self-care. I acknowledge that self-care is obviously recognised by care professionals as part of the health care process, but like prevention, it should not be a sort of afterthought, a concept that we think invaluable, but we never actually get around to fully including it in our health ecosystem in the way we really ought to. Um, my First Amendment uh, set out in the paper, in the amendment paper, will ensure that every day well-being, self-care for minor ailments and the management of long-term conditions are promoted and integrated into health, the local health systems. As we learned during the first waves of the pandemic, those with minor ailments are best placed to seek care within their local community, for example by practising self-care or seeking advice from their local pharmacist to support them. Uh, in their illness. There's nothing wrong with promoting self-care, but it must be part of a wider, more comprehensive health system uh, where it is needed. The health system has promoted health care forever. It's always done that. It's part of the process. An integrated care system should become statutory for organisations, primary care networks or PCNs will continue to be an important conduit for improving self-care in the community. They provide an opportunity for community pharmacy to be fully integrated into local primary care and improve communications across all primary health care providers. And promoting and integrating self-care across the self-care continuum from everyday well-being to self-care for minor ailments um, and the management of long-term conditions to help empower people to know when and how to self-care and in turn support more sustainable local health systems. My second amendment, in my second amendment, I want to focus on how community pharmacists are well placed to drive a holistic approach to self-care. They can help to advise people on the most effective over-the-counter treatments as well as self-care techniques. For example, for the community pharmacist consultation service, which has been an important initial step in ensuring the system is designed to support self-care for treatable conditions. I would ensure, and it, my amendment would ensure, that strategies developed by integrated care partnerships take account of the benefits that services provided by pharmacists for minor ailments can provide, in turn helping to integrate these services into local care pathways. Many people in COVID decided not to go to GPs, and many continue to say they won't be going to GPs. They will, like, they will try to get support outside the GP system, and a couple of uh, surveys have indicated that as part of that self-care process. So some of the questions that are asked, how do they feel about getting advice online, from online or from a pharmacist? Madam Deputy Speaker, I reaffirm, if it were needed, that self-care Self-care is not about self-isolation from care services. It's not about reducing the strain on the NHS by a sort of self-imposed rationing. It's not about diverting people away from health care, rather providing another route into it. And these amendments, at the very least, ask the government to think on the need for a more structured approach to self-care that is there to help benefits and patient benefits. The question is, does this bill in the round achieve a reboot in the light of COVID to self-care. I'm not sure it does, 
but I'd ask the Minister to very carefully consider the process of self-care in a much more formalised way. Caroline Dynish. Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise to speak on new clause 49. For 40 years, successive governments have tried desperately to address this issue, and successive governments have put it in the too difficult pile. It is incredibly expensive. It is hellishly complicated. And to put it simply, there is no silver bullet to address all of the concerns surrounding it. And that is why I am so proud that this government has made an attempt to grip this issue. The fact is that what happens to us in old age is entirely random and whether we incur catastrophic care costs that wipe out everything we've worked for in our life is down quite often to luck. The current system is complex, it's unfair, it's why so many people just simply don't understand it and that's been compounded by the fact that successive governments, nobody's blameless, <clears throat> have used really unhelpful language like death tax, like dementia tax, which have made people terrified of this issue and it's blown any government's attempts to try and solve this out of the water. It strikes fear into people's heart about what happens to us when we're elderly, when we're vulnerable, when we can't look after ourselves anymore. As humans, it's something we don't want to talk about, we don't want to consider, we don't want to think about this happening to us. And not for us, the slow decay, not for us, the hellishly expensive degeneration that affects maybe four in ten, but the catastrophic amounts of money that in fact affect maybe one in seven. And that's why insurance models have never really worked. <clears throat> this particular clause looks to amend the cap on care, basically where the local authority costs should contribute to the metering towards this cap. And I have to be honest, I've thought really hard about whether I can support this. Many people, including the brilliant Andrew Dilner, have pointed out the financial inequalities and, in fact, some of the geographical inequalities of removing the local authority contribution. And since local authority contributions differ by area already, they're the, the much higher and better off areas. There's already a postcode lottery of care, depending on where you live. We have to address this. The key thing here, I think, is not the cap, it's the floor. Those with lower property values will be protected by the floor, not the cap. The reforms increase the threshold above which people must meet the full cost of their care from 23,000 to 100,000, more than four times the limit. The daily living costs limit of 200 pounds per week mean more people will keep more of their income and assets. And the package includes domiciliary care, which many others haven't. It's not perfect. It's far from perfect. But everyone who is contributing towards their social care today and those of us who face the uncertainty of this possible spectre in our future will be better off than they are now. This is why we have to move forward in a way that is deliverable and in a way that we can finally, for once, get over the finishing line after 40 years of trying. There are details that need to be fleshed out. The white paper for me just can't come soon enough. In particular, I just want to mention two burning issues. The first of those is how we support working age adults who make up over half of those who need adult social care. Some people need that care throughout their lives. For others, it happens to them unexpectedly. Uh, how do we support the people of working age for whom care costs are not paid out of a nest egg that they might have been able to build up over decades of work? And finally, the biggest issue facing adult social care is the workforce. It's a job which is significantly undervalued. It's too often described as unskilled, which drives me mad. These people have unbelievable skills. They have experience, they have passion, and we entrust some of our most valuable, our most precious family members into their care, into their hands. Frequently, they could just make more money in hospitality or retail. How, as a government, do we create a society which values these heroes for what they are? I look forward to reading the white paper and seeing how the government will tackle some of these really thorny issues, the most intransigent challenges facing our adult social care system, because for these, money alone will not be enough. Yeah. Yeah. Daisy Cooper. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'd like to start by talking about social care. The Liberal Democrats have long called for reform to properly integrate health and social care services, but this bill does not do that. As others have mentioned, this bill seeks to reorganise parts of the NHS, but it pays lip service only to social care. And that's why the Lib Dems think that this bill should be put on hold until the proper social care reforms are brought forward. As others have mentioned, it has been months since the Prime Minister announced his plan to fix social care, but it is unforgivable. This new clause was sneaked out during the sleaze row last week right. in a move that changed the goalposts. Right. I think the Minister would do well 
to listen to the unease on his backbenchers as well as on this side of the House. Now, struggling families face being hammered by a double whammy, unfair tax rises and the prospect of losing their homes to fund care costs. I note that the Right Honourable Member for West Suffolk is no longer in his seat, but I noted that he very selectively quoted Andrew Dilnot. He didn't quote Andrew Dilnot's comments on New Clause 49. Andrew Dilnot said that this proposal was not welcome. He said he was very disappointed, and he said this represented a big change that would be fine savings exclusively from the less well off. Two promises from this Tory government now broken. There's also no mention in this bill of the millions of people who are unpaid carers in the UK. No mention at all, even though we know that carers are twice as likely to experience ill health as a result of caring. That's why I've tabled New Clause 63 for debate tomorrow, supported by Carers UK, calling for the NHS to ensure that the health and well-being of unpaid carers is taken into account when decisions are made concerning the health and care of the person for whom they care. I hope the Government will support it. I know it is grouped for debate tomorrow, but I reference it now to highlight again the fact that this Bill does not present a comprehensive plan to reform social care. This Bill also represents a massive and unnecessary power grab by the Secretary of State. It is simply wrong for the Government to have the power to abolish arm's length bodies, to approve or reject the ICS chairs. The public has been rightly outraged at the political meddling in the issue of COVID contracts and the Government should learn its lesson. We should all be seeking to protect the independence of the NHS. Madam Deputy Speaker, vacancies in, a, in the NHS and social care are utterly staggering. We know the numbers. 100,000 vacancies in the NHS, more than 120,000 vacancies in social care, 1.5 million people currently missing out on the care that they need. We simply cannot go on like this, with the government setting its own sporadic targets and then constantly missing them. NHS waiting lists are at a record high. Ambulance services have received a record number of calls in October. Major A&Es have treated more than 1.4 million people in October, the third highest month on record. This draft bill will do nothing to get those waiting lists down, nothing to recruit the workforce that we need, nothing to help people get seen faster, and nothing for the millions of unpaid carers. So the government should delay this bill for a few months and look properly at reforming social care rather than trying to do a half-baked job now. But I don't think the government will, and that's why the Lib Dems will vote against it. Maria Miller. I listened very carefully to my honourable friend as he introduced new clause 49 earlier this evening because the funding of social care has been a huge concern for too many years. And the people we represent deserve far more certainty for how their old age will be funded if they require social care. We have a pension system, we have a system to support disabled people, but the funding of social care is a real uncertainty. And I pay tribute to the Minister, to my honourable friend, for bringing forward these costed proposals to provide some certainty for the future for more people. And he's to be commended for that. And he's been commended, he has to be commended to be clear, for being clear that no one will lose out under these proposals and that the majority will be better off because of the issues that we've already gone through, but particularly because of the means test threshold being significantly raised as he outlined and um, he, he can, that he can say that with some force because of the extra more than £5 billion pounds being put forward by this government to fund social care in a sustainable way in the future. But there's still clearly some concern, as he can hear from the debate today, and as my right honourable friend uh, has already said, um, that no solution in this area is going to be perfect. So I was particularly uh, pleased to hear from him 
that he plans to uh, publish an impact assessment uh, which will clearly set out the impact of this measure, okay. these measures across the board, and that's very important. Um, secondly and finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd just like to speak in support of my new clause 102, which is tabled in my name. Uh, we all know that the quality of support that we give to victims of abuse, domestic abuse and sexual abuse, is a marker for the health of our society, and it's not just a matter for the NHS, but the NHS plays a vital part and amendment uh, sorry new clause 102 requires the joint forward plan for integrated care boards and their partners to properly set out the steps they propose to take to address the particular needs of victims of domestic abuse be that domestic violence or sexual abuse of both children and adults now, it doesn't limit the plan to just address uh, victims of domestic abuse, as I know there are many other types of abuse which are equally devastating. But I've put forward an amendment which is um, permissive enough to allow for potential innovation and improved ways of working to, developed in, to be developed in guidance in the future. And I hope that um, it could be used as a basis for guidance to integrated care boards as part of their general powers. This amendment is not just one part, is, one, is just one part of a greater whole. Uh, the Police, Crime and Sentencing and Courts Bill in particular will require action from across government. But I believe that this amendment will particularly help ensure that every part of the state is pulling in the same direction when it comes to these issues. Now, this amendment is similar to that which was outlined by my honourable friend, the member for Newton Abbott, earlier on, but I think, in, and specifically, that was New Clause 33. But I think the way that this amendment in my name is tabled is more uh, permissive and less prescriptive. So I hope that perhaps the government may find it acceptable to. Um, to and I give way to the I'm, minister. I'm very grateful to uh, my right honourable um, friend for giving way and for the case she is making. I should also put on record I'm grateful to my honourable friend, the member for Newton Abbott, for the work she's done in this space and her proposal. But can I say to my right honourable friend, the member for um, Basingstoke, that Her Majesty's Government is happy to accept the amendment she proposes at 102 on domestic abuse and support for victims of domestic abuse. I, I, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, can I thank the Minister for that acceptance of this amendment? And I think there will be many people across all sides of the House that will see this as a continuation of this government's commitment to tackling issues of domestic abuse and sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And I thank the Minister for such a positive acceptance. And uh, with that, I'll draw my uh, remarks to a close. Bell Ribeiro Adi. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak overall obviously against the bill, um, but in favour of new clauses 56 and 57 um, in my name. And um, those amendments and new clauses in the name of any member who has sought to, to change the pernicious outcomes of this bill. Our, our NHS is really one of the best things about this country, but this bill is the biggest threat to it yet. Rolling out um, the red carpet for private companies, ramping up this government's long-standing attempts to privatise the NHS and making it easier for what we've witnessed over the past 18 months, which is contract after contract, awarded without competitive process and failing companies rewarded with new contracts again and again. This bill would be the destruction of our NHS um, as we know it. And it will widen the inequalities that the pandemic has already exacerbated. We now have over 5.7 million people on NHS waiting lists. Of course, of course, this is not solely because of, of the pandemic, um, far from it. In 2010, uh, after the government won, won the election, there were about two to three quarters of a million people on NHS waiting lists, but these have risen every year um, before the pandemic. So it's the long-term effect of conservative policies of underfunding and privatisation. But waiting lists have now doubled and our NHS is now in danger of toppling over. All the while, health inequality is rising. And that's why, with the support of the Health Foundation, I've tabled New Clause 57, which would compel the NHS to set out data collection guidelines on health inequalities. We know they exist. We've seen them play out um, with the worst consequences from postcode lotteries to racial disparities. And it's time we accepted this, collected the proper data, and actually set about real change. It's a farce that we don't already do so. 
Since 2010, improvements in life expectancy in England have actually slowed more than any other country in Europe, and the gap in, in, in years that people can expect to live good health has widened even further between rich and poor. And during the pandemic, this was shown by high, higher death rates amongst people living in more deprived areas, and for certain populations, more notably disabled people and people from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. And for people younger than 65, the COVID-19 mortality rate was almost four times higher uh, for the 10% living in the most deprived areas um, than those in the, in the least deprived. Now, this is nothing new. Um, you know, the, the Marmot Review has have covered this uh, many times. And earlier this year, the King's Fund um, for the NHS Race and Health Observatory uh, has actually found that any success, success, success that we've had in tackling health inequalities is always drowned out by other strains like waiting times and, and other clinical priorities. Put quite simply, we can't tackle inequalities because this government has never put inequality at the front and centre of its policy making, which makes its so-called levelling up agenda meaningless. Now, this bill um, enshrines this so-called new triple aim to promote um, all of these, these different practices, but the government is so short-sighted it's declined to incorporate health inequalities into the triple aim. And what a complete missed opportunity that is, or a clear indication that the government couldn't really really uh, care less um, before, before anybody says any, any different and that the NHS has other means of doing this. We need to look at the state um, of, of the outcomes and clearly that, that what's happening isn't working. The government has continuously and, and repeatedly failed to accept institutional discrimination, let alone meeting its duties under equalities law. And we've heard recently about the issues of um, oxidometers and dark skin and how these would have contributed to worse outcomes. And so the Secretary of State for Health has called for a review into gender and, and, and race bias in medical equipment, um, which is quite frankly groundbreaking because that's all we seem to do, have reviews. Um, this is the type of policies that we would have if we just heeded um, the government's reviews gone past and if we just you know, looked at our equality impact assessments. And Madam Deputy Speaker, there's no excuse for the government uh, to keep ignoring what is already set out in law and in terms of, of, of meeting the equalities duties to people right across this country. Thank you. Charles Walker. Well, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I caught your eye half a minute ago, and you indicated to me with that look that I was next. And my heart rate quickened, because I'm always nervous when I speak in this place, because we do really important stuff here. All of us do really important stuff, and this is an important bill. Now, the Health and Social Care Act in 2012, when it was a bill before it became an act, was amended by the Conservative government. It was amended in pursuit of parity of esteem. The Conservative government then, well, it was the coalition government, changed general references to health to physical health and mental health. And that was the right thing to do. It wasn't a courageous thing to do. It was entirely the right thing to do. Now, I have a series of amendments on the order paper over the next two days, 10, if I've counted them right, that asks the government in this bill to make an amendment so general references to health are changed to mental health and physical health. It's a call to arms. These changes are not just totemic, they're also hugely important because over the next few years we need to recruit 9,000 more mental health nurses to look after our constituents. More than 800 new psychiatrists. And we need to give all organisations charged with delivering health care that nudge, that push, that call to arms that they need to make these important things happen. But we also need to send another message from this place. On top of all the other messages that we've sent, over the past nine years, that we believe there is no physical health without good mental health, and good mental health means good physical health. So I'm looking at the Minister, because he's made a couple of staggering interventions on colleagues tonight. <laughs> colleagues in full flow, prostrating themselves at the feet of government, have suddenly been rewarded been rewarded with that stylish, charming intervention when he says, this minister says, the government has heard your cries and it shall act on them. And I look, 
I look at the joy. I looked at the joy that spread across the right honourable lady's face and the right honourable gentleman's face, the former Secretary of State who spoke before me. I look at the support I get from the most recent former Secretary of State. There are a few of them. And, <laughs> and a former Prime Minister. So can I ask the Minister to make one of those gen generous interventions to me this evening? I'm still here. I'm, I'm, I want to sit down, but if he's not going to make that generous intervention right now, awesome. I shall be back tomorrow. But I shall also be travelling up to the other place to knock on its door to make sure that these amendments are tabled up there and eventually we get our way. Karen Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, came into this place largely on the back of the disastrous Lansley Act, and I'm pleased to see it banished to the dustbins of history, which is what this bill essentially does. And it banishes to the uh, academic shells of how not to make policy. Lansley took a sledgehammer to our work in primary care trusts, to partnerships, to morale, and our capacity to forward plan. Along with the austerity funding that came along with it, it was a direct result that led to the poor state in which we entered the pandemic, yeah, and that right. must absolutely be front and central to any further review of the pandemic. This bill is a seminal point in the history of the NHS because it banishes again the experiment of competition as an organising principle and the driver of efficiency again to the history books. The key issue, though, is what replaces it, because now we have in its place local cartels dominated by hospital trusts and the supreme power of the Secretary of State to interfere in all local decisions. There are no powers here for local elected representatives. There's no power for primary care or community care or mental health. There is no voice for patients. There is no voice for the public. There is no voice for the taxpayer who's been asked to increasingly pay ever more. And as we move to an ever more costly health service, accountability and transparency of our NHS in this, in, the, in this new role has to be front and central of organisation in the future in order to bring people with us on that journey of paying more. I put forward two amendments in this, in this part of the bill around um, the need for these local boards to be cognisant of palliative care and end-of-life care, and also my other amendment is around a local infrastructure finance trust. Uh, local public-private sector bodies that were introduced under the last Labour government which are instrumental in providing good primary and community care estate, something that this government is allowing to wither on the vine. My own hospital, South Bristol Community Hospital, needs more support in these infrastructure, infrastructure trusts in order to thrive in the future so that people have decent, good quality estate from which to receive their care. Can I also draw attention, Madam Deputy Speaker, to new clause 23, which will be discussed tomorrow, my Good Governance Commission. This, if it was enacted by the government, I generally offer as a, as a helpful way forward, would avoid the cronyism that we've become used to. It would make sure that local bodies were more democratically accountable to their populations, they're more cognizant of the needs of those local populations, and would crucially make sure that the people that are leading those bodies locally do are fit and proper and do meet basic criteria about um, what is expected on them, and again would have some crucial accountability to local populations. It's akin to the Appointments Commission that was abolished in the abolition of the Quangos. I think that was a huge mistake, and it would really help uh, get around some of the real concerns that we have now around how our local health services are governed if the government uh, took notice of that. Can I just in my final time to address some of the comments being made about the new clause on, on, on um, social care, which is a disappointment. It is unexpected. We had six weeks in committee. We could have looked at this more carefully, and that would have uh, shone a bit of light on this. But actually, he's not in his place. But the Honourable Member of West Sussex, I think, tried to say very clearly say what, what, what this is really about, in that one part of the state should not be subsidising another part of the state. He started to say that this was a true Conservative principle. He is absolutely right. What this does now is remind people that are in receipt of benefits Benefits, that they are in receipt of those benefits and anything they may have built up should not be counted towards, towards that future. It is punitive. It is a property tax. And I'm old enough to remember what happened to the last Conservative government that introduced a regressive property tax. And I think they really ought to think again. David Simmons. Thank you. I've now just brought my attention to my register of interest in that I'm married to an NHS doctor uh, employed by a hospital trust that serves my constituents. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, firstly in respect of new clause 49. 
Now, for those of us who have been in the world of local government for a long time, um, we will have seen the attempts by governments of various parties to address the financial settlement around social care. I chaired a social services committee that pushed through the charging policies introduced by the last Labour government in an attempt to address these costs. I was chair of a social services committee that had to balance the demands of the fair access criteria and see the last Labour government drive a coach and horses through uh, a lot of local provision. And recognising that we should all seek to ask questions of government around how we address in particular the impact on working age adults. I would say in response to the people who are asking, are we proud of what we are here to do tonight? That we should be proud of the fact that we are willing to take what are sometimes difficult decisions that ensure that we balance the books and have a sustainable financial settlement that supports social care for our constituents. Now, it is too late for my two grandparents who went through this process, who saw very modest assets consumed in the cost of providing long-term care, but I welcome the fact that my constituents and people up and down the country will benefit from what this government is seeking to achieve. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to just move briefly on to new clause 55, which is uh, in respect of responsibilities for ICSs when it comes to provision of services and planning for services for our youngest children. Now, the member for South West Surrey um, made a very helpful intervention in pointing out the effectiveness of Ofsted-style regulation in ensuring the quality of what is provided at a local level. And having had an excellent debate in this chamber just a few weeks ago, discussing uh, the work that was done by my right honourable friend, the member for South Northamptonshire, which was reflected in the budgetary decisions that were brought forward earlier on. It seems very clear to me that in uh, bringing an amendment supported by over 70 organisations in the field of children's care, that we have uh, an opportunity, an opportunity that was debated and touched on through various assurances from ministers at the committee stage, to make sure we have the right level of rigour and accountability in what we ask of those ICSs so that we can ensure that our youngest children, our babies, our, the neonatal care that's provided, and indeed our young people who, going up to the age of 25, are already covered by statutory provisions in respect of special educational needs and care leaving, are appropriately covered. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Um, I'm going to reduce the time limit to three minutes in the hope that as many people as possible can get in. Richard Bergen. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, and this health and care bill is deeply uh, problematic. And I want to focus uh, on two issues that, when combined, mean that this bill is a complete disaster. It not only makes it easier for private health giants to profit from a national health service, it actually also makes a charter for corruption, because this bill opens the door for even greater private sector involvement in our NHS, and it's why, really, this bill should be called the NHS Corporate Takeover Bill. For example, by allowing private corporations to sit on health boards, and the Government's uh, Amendment 25 doesn't go nearly far enough, uh, these boards make critical decisions about NHS budgets and services. Even before this bill, an unbelievable £100 billion has gone to non-NHS providers of health care over the last decade alone. And early this year, half a million patients, half a million patients have had their GP services quietly passed into the hands of the US health insurance giants. And this bill would lock in yet more privatisation in the future, with even less scrutiny even less scrutiny, because this bill means less transparency. It means private health giants getting an even bigger slice of the action with less scrutiny. Uh, I will give way. I, I thank the uh, Honourable Member for giving way and uh, to draw uh, the House's attention to a declaration of members' interests of practising NHS doctor. I just wondered, on the issue of private health care provision, he will obviously recognise that GPs are, in fact, small businesses in their own right, and some of them are quite large businesses. And I wondered how does he equate um, the role of the GP as a, a small business uh, in the context of his concerns about private health care? Well, I thank the Honourable Member for his uh, intervention. We're not seeking to wage war on GPs. We want to support GPs, properly resource them. And we see so many GPs uh, retiring and not being uh, replaced. But it's this government that's actually waging war on our NHS with this further Americanisation 
uh, of our NHS. It's a dangerous cocktail. The dodgy contracts we've seen throughout COVID risk becoming the norm. The billions squandered on test and trace should serve as a warning, a warning of what the government could do to the whole of our NHS. Madam Deputy Speaker, there is a sleight of hand going on with this bill. It's true that under this bill, NHS bodies will no longer have to put services out to competitive tender to the private sector. Such tendering to the private sector was made a requirement in 2012 under the Coalition Government Section 75. It was a shameful act and the scrapping of it has long been demanded by those opposed to the privatisation of our National Health Service. But the change in this bill does not reverse privatisation because without making the NHS the default provider, this simply means that contracts can not only still go to private healthcare corporations, but they can do so without other bids having to have been considered. And to prevent all of this, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, I put down an amendment, uh, amendment number nine to the bill. Uh, and I do want to move it, and I do want to uh, put it to a vote, unless, of course, uh, the government accepts it, because my amendment establishes the NHS as the default option. And the members opposite groan, but the only reason not to support my amendment is if you don't believe, if people don't believe uh, in uh, the NHS not moving yeah. to a privatised insurance model. Why else would people object to it being? Um, the default provider of health care. The British Medical Association supports it. So the Tory groans are groans against the position of the British Medical Association. Unison supports it. So the Tory groans are groans against the voices of those who work in the NHS. And most of them, if they have to have more than one job, it's because they don't get paid enough, not because they're trying to uh, get their own snouts uh, in the trough. I'll be voting against the whole uh, bill, but if the government refuses to accept this amendment, number nine, to make the NHS the default provider, then it shows what the government of the party that objected to the foundation of the NHS in the first place is really up to, despite all the warm words. Mel Stride. Deputy Speaker, I rise to speak to new clause 49 in doing so. Uh, whatever its merits or otherwise, I think it is worth reflecting the comments made yeah. by the Minister that we are at least here this evening looking at a part of a process that is going to lead to some progress in terms of meeting social care costs going forward, moving the catastrophic risk that has hung above the heads of all our constituents up and down the country that possibly their health care costs may end up costing them all of their assets, and also having taken the tough decisions around having uh, raise taxes in order to fund those arrangements. But I do have problems, Madam Deputy Speaker, with new clause uh, 47. It seems to me that in order to make good law in this place, we need both the time to consider the matters put before us, and secondly, we need the appropriate information yeah, yeah. upon which to take those decisions. And on both those points, I have real concerns about the way that new clause 49 has been brought forward. The first that we heard of it was not in the committee stage of this House. It was not in September when the uh, general uh, measures were put forward, including the taxation measures upon which we all uh, divided and voted. Uh, but actually on Wednesday evening, uh, when the uh, amendment was actually tabled. Now, it was fortuitous, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the Treasury Select Committee happened to have Sir Andrew uh, Dilnot before us the very next day, and we were able to discuss many of the issues uh, inherent in new clause uh, 49 and of course a number of issues were raised to which only the government has the answers and one of them has been put forward very powerfully by speaker after speaker tonight which is what are the assess the impact assessments associated uh, with these uh, measures and it seems to me that because I wrote to the chancellor immediately after our committee and asked him for some uh, impact assessments including geographical impact assessments of which we have had none that the only information we have had was released by the Department of Health and Social Care on Friday night, a document called Adult Social Care Charging Reform uh, Analysis. And it seems to me that in there, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm very short of time, which is a shame, but that under uh, a, a, an example of a chart for a 10-year care journey looking at individuals with different asset levels, that whilst it is true that my honourable friend the Minister points out that these arrangements, even with the amendment of new clause 49, are better at almost every level of wealth 
than they are under the status quo. It is not the case that compared with the measures that were brought forward in September that everybody is better off. And if you look at those that are worse off, it is most definitely uh, those. I will give way to the Honourable Lady. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I um, am grateful to the Honourable Member for giving way. Um, he gets to the heart of the matter, which is about what people will get compared to what they were promised. Isn't that really the heart of this matter? Well, I think the heart of the matter, and I, I thank the Honourable Lady for her intervention, I think the heart of the matter is the fact that we have to be clear and wide-eyed about what this change will actually do. Yes, it is true that it will leave us in a better position than the status quo, but it is not the case that for those that are less well off, it will leave them in a better position than if new clause 49 were not passed by this House. And in fact, at the level of about £106,000 worth of assets, by my read of this graph, uh, about 59% of those assets would be lost on average by those in that situation under the original proposals. But under the amended proposals, that figure would rise to 70% of those assets. And when it comes to those that would be better off as a consequence of new clause, uh, 49. Many of those are the better off because they're actually benefit, benefiting uh, from the changes that are being made to the daily living costs, which my honourable friend, the Minister, uh, referred to. I am out of time, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, but I do believe that these measures should have been better ventilated in this House, certainly at committee stage, if not earlier, and then we would have had better information and more time which to take these important judgments. Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy yeah. Speaker. And I want to very briefly speak to Amendment 15, which focuses on the membership of integrated care partnerships, the bodies, as we know, that will, will be responsible for developing plans to address the health and care needs of local populations. This amendment would enable the Secretary of State to make specific provisions ensuring the representation of particular areas of health care on ICPs via secondary legislation. And in particular, I am concerned about having a strong voice for women's health in ICPs. But I would also mention in passing the need for other groups to be represented, such as carers in an ICP area. As the co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group on sexual and reproductive health care, I have seen how the experience of women in relation to their health care can often be an afterthought in a fragmented health system. From the vaginal mesh scandal to the recent debate about pain during insertion of IUDs, a form of contraception, maternity provision and cuts to contraceptive provision. This amendment would ensure the issue of representation was considered by government. It has strong support from the medical bodies in this area, including the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Health Care and the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists, as well as other areas of health care such as childhood cancer or, as previously mentioned, carers groups. I believe that it is important to protect the independence of ICPs and ensure that they are able to set a strategy that effectively meets local needs. However, there is also a need to ensure that women's voices are not left behind in the decision making. Without this amendment, it cannot be assumed that those voices will be heard on all ICPs. So I hope the Government will consider the purpose of this amendment and that it would, in actual fact, strengthen the Bill. Thank you, Madam Deputy yeah. Speaker. Theresa Villiers. There is much to be positive about in relation to the history of the National Health Service over recent years. NHS England research indicates that the outcomes for most major conditions are significantly better than they were 10 years ago. The NHS is seeing more patients and delivering more tests, treatments and operations than at any time in its 73-year history, millions more than 10 years ago when the Conservatives returned to power. And to reassure those concerned by some of the campaigns around this bill, I want to emphasise that this Conservative government is committed to NHS values and we are delivering the biggest ever cash increase in NHS funding. It's just plain wrong to accuse the government of trying to privatise the NHS. In fact, it was the last Labour government that pushed competition and private sector involvement, including many PFI contracts that proved to be both unwise and massively expensive. If anything, this bill takes the NHS in the other direction, reducing the role for competition and increasing the scope for cooperation. At its core are the integrated care systems considered by the current batch of amendments. The provisions on the bill on ICSs 
enjoy considerable support from within the NHS. They build on the NHS's own proposals for reform to make it less bureaucratic and more accountable and to enable it to be more integrated with other local service providers such as councils. So I won't be backing the amendments in this group except for the governments. I welcome Amendment 25 with the clarity it provides to ensure that appointments to um, ICBs won't in any way jeopardise their independence. By dismantling elements of the complex system for compulsory tendering of services, we will free up time and resources in the NHS and remove barriers to local cooperation so we can improve patient care. <clears throat> but we all recognise that ever-increasing healthcare need is placing great pressure on the NHS, and that will rise in the years to come as more of us become frail and need extra care. So I would ask the Minister, in his response today and tomorrow, to emphasise how we will train, recruit and retain the professionals we need to deliver NHS services. There are record numbers of doctors and nurses working in our NHS, and I pay tribute to each and every one of them. But it is crucial to step up the numbers, especially GPs. GPs in my constituency are overstretched. We need more of them. This needs to be a priority for the government. The, the House will appreciate that I have had to give precedence to people who have amendments in their names on the order paper, and not everyone else will be able to have a, a chance to speak this evening. Apsana Begum. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And in, in the interest of time, I will just speak to uh, my amendment 99 um, and the amendment uh, and the new clause 57 tabled by my honourable friend, the member for Streatham. Um, and, and to begin with, with uh, new clause 57, um, the government uh, quite often talk the talk on health inequalities but fail to walk the walk. Um, new clause 57 sets out a requirement that NHS England must publish guidance in relation to health inequalities and I wholeheartedly support that clause. Uh, my amendment uh, 99 seeks to reduce, in, uh, seeks to put provisions into reduce inequalities between non-migrant and migrant users of, NH, uh, of health services. Campaigners and experts have argued that the pandemic has shown that more tangible action is needed to tackle health inequalities. The increased risks of those on lower incomes and black, Asian and minority ethnic communities catching and dying from COVID-19 has been well documented, yet the provisions outlined in the bill would likely make the situation much worse. So that's why I've tabled Amendment 99 in particular after seeing evidence that people are being denied access to health care or facing high charges for doing so because of their immigration status. As part of the hostile environment, the government has increasingly been restricting access to the NHS for certain migrants by introducing upfront charging for those unable to prove their entitlement to care, charging migrants of the for the cost of treatment and sharing NHS patient data with the Home Office for the purposes of immigration control. Madam Deputy Speaker, surely in any civilised society, migrants should have automatic access to services without fear of detention or deportation and without facing barriers that deny them their rights. Everyone being entitled to treatment goes to the core of what the NHS is and why it is valued and beloved, because access to high quality healthcare is possible for all, and this can be done best when healthcare provision is publicly run publicly accessible and publicly accountable as well. My constituents deserve nothing less and I will never stop pursuing this goal until it becomes a reality. Thank you. Yeah. Andrea Ledson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yeah. This bill can really help support giving every baby the best start for life. Firstly, new clause 55 in the name of my honourable friend, the member for, Rice, for Ricelip, Northwood and Pinner, would require the Secretary of State to publish guidance on how integrated care systems should meet the needs specifically of babies. The Best Start for Life report published in March calls for every local area to publish a seamless Start for Life offer for every new family. That must include midwifery, health visiting, mental health support and targeted services such as couple counselling, debt advice and smoking cessation. Each of these services is currently provided from silos within the public, private and civic sector, 
so properly integrating them is no small task. I urge my honourable friend to ensure there is very clear guidance to every local area on how they should coordinate their support for babies. Madam Deputy Speaker, I also want to support Amendments 91 and 92 in the name of my honourable friend, the Member for Broxbourne, that calls for parity of esteem between mental and physical health. Mental health support for families who are struggling in that critical early period is vital, and the London School of Economics has assessed that perinatal depression, anxiety and psychosis carry a total long-term cost to society of about £8.1 billion for each one-year cohort of births in the UK. Prevention is not only kinder, but so much cheaper than cure. And finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to support my right honourable friend for Basingstoke's Amendment 102 that calls for integrated care boards to provide clarity about their plans to tackle domestic violence. And I'm delighted the Minister has already agreed to accept it. Analysis by the Wave Trust indicates that up to 30% of domestic violence begins during pregnancy. The Wave Trust highlights the crucial nature of experiences in the period conception to the age of three in the formation of seriously violent personalities, largely because of the sensitive nature of the infant brain in those formative years. Domestic violence within a family is incredibly damaging to the emotional development of a baby, and I encourage my honourable friend to ensure that plans for tackling domestic violence don't just include between partners, but also on reducing the impact on babies. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, you've heard me speak in this place before about giving every baby the best start for life, and I keep doing so because I'm convinced that if we invest in the thousand and one critical days, we really will transform our society for the better. It's in the period from conception to the age of two that the building blocks for lifelong physical and emotional health are laid down. Thank you. Deputy Speaker, um, I, I wasn't actually expecting to get called in the end, but um, here we are. I just want to tell a little story, a little story about my dad. My dad often rings me and tells me the things I should say in Parliament. Uh, I'm not entirely sure any of you are quite ready for it, but I, I want to tell you a story about my dad. He was born in a council, well, he was born actually in the war, and he... Um, he was given, they were given a council house by the, the Attlee government. My dad could lecture you on it for all weeks. Uh, he was uh, given a council house, which his very conservative parents bought in the uh, 1980s. My granny, unbelievably, a lovely, generous woman, massive Thatcherite, bought her council house uh, in the 1980s. And that council house stands in my constituency. It's wor worth around £120,000. My dad went on to get an education, a free education, uh, and uh, he uh, moved into an area of Birmingham which wasn't very trendy at the time. And he stayed there, and I was born there, and my brothers lived there. And all through our lives, we watched that area get a little bit trendier. Uh, and my dad's house, which he bought for £30,000, the price went up and up and up. He didn't particularly do much work. I mean, he likes to woodwork in his garage, but he did, you know, he, he's not done much. His house is probably worth around £700,000 now from when he bought it and it was £30,000. If my dad were here today, what he would say to you, and what he will almost certainly say to me because he watches it all lurking on Twitter, is that he doesn't deserve to keep his wealth for his children at any greater rate than the people who live in the council house that his parents bought on Froddersley Road in Sheldon. And yet today, they will subsidise the people who live in my constituency in that council house that my granny bought to try and get a better life. They will subsidise the care of my father, who has a £700,000 house that I don't need to inherit. I'm all right. I got quite a good job. It is totally unacceptable that that is the situation that we are putting almost 
all of my constituents in compared to the constituents in Chipping Norton, for example, or other members who have stood up and spoken, my constituents will largely be left with nothing. They won't be grateful. Minister Ed Arger. I'm very grateful, Madam Deputy Speaker, and conscious of time, I will try to cover off some of the main themes that have emerged in today's debate. Um, I'm grateful for the debate that we have had today. This legislation, I would remind the House, is in the vast majority of what is contained in it exactly what the NHS said it wanted, that it needed, and it is the right legislation being brought forward at the right time to drive forward those priorities highlighted by the NHS in their 2019 consultation. It is legislation that drives forward integration. It drives forward integration not only within the local NHS within a region or in an area, but it also drives forward greater integration with a local authority, and it provides the foundations on which we can continue to build as we move forward with greater integration of health and social care services designed to work around the individual rather than in institutional silos. Despite <coughs> misleading claims by campaigners, indeed by some opposite, this does not privatise the NHS. The NHS will always be free at the point of delivery. The NHS has been in this party's hands longer than it has in the hands of any other party, and this party has put in place a record investment in terms of resources in our NHS. What we are proposing today, and in this bill, continues to build upon that. In respect of our amendment, Amendment 25, Government Amendment 25, around ICBs, we are clear. ICBs are NHS bodies. They have always been NHS bodies in our proposals, and we have put in place provisions to provide conflicts of interest. But just to make sure, given the misleading claims about private involvement, we have brought forward new clause 25, which puts beyond doubt that these are NHS bodies and must act in the best interests of the NHS. It is an amendment, Madam Deputy Speaker, that is much stronger, much more effectively drafted than those alternatives put forward by the Opposition, because we believe in putting this question beyond doubt. In terms of the ICBs and ICPs, um, we have sought to be permissive rather than prescriptive, giving those local systems within a national framework the flexibility to deliver what they need to deliver for their local areas, the local areas they know best. In terms of certain contributions, I'm, I've been happy to accept Amendments 102 and 114. Um, I reflect and will continue to reflect, and I suspect he will not, in the nicest possible way, rightly go away. My hon. Friend, the Member for Broxbourne, I will con continue to reflect on the points he has made. Um, in respect of the former Secretary of State, I thought he set out very clearly um, the case, the former Secretary of State, the member for, uh, from Surrey, the, uh, the case for his amendment, which I was happy to accept, and the importance it places upon patient safety. Um, the Honourable Lady, the member for South Northamptonshire, um, has done a huge amount of work in this space. I pay tribute to her, and she is right. We will look very carefully in the statutory guidance at how we can emphasise that. The Honourable Lady for Newton Abbott, I feel, was not in her seat when I pay tribute to the work she had done previously, but I put that on record as well. Um, turning to um, New Clause 49, um, the Honourable Lady, my Honourable Friend, the member for uh, Gosport, um, a distinguished former care minister, made the point extremely well. She highlighted um, the fact that this is a significant improvement and step forward on where we currently are 
in respect of tackling the social care um, challenge. I'm afraid I won't, because I have only a couple of minutes in which to try to address these points. Um, and I did give way a dozen or so times, I think, in my opening um, remarks. But I do equally, I recognise, as always in this House, the strength and genuine sincerity of the vo views and the points put by honourable members on both sides, genuinely highlighting and wishing to explore certain aspects of new clause 5. Now, to understand exactly what it does, exactly how it works, and I have um, complete um, respect for the strength of those views. I believe, as the uh, member for West Suffolk set out very clearly, this is um, a significant step forward. It will make a huge difference, and it must be treated as part, Madam Deputy Speaker, of a package of measures rather than in isolation. And we must look, as he quite rightly highlighted, at the flaws as well as the cap and at the support that's available and the increases in those flaws from £14,250 to £20,000 and, uh, and up to £100,000. Madam Deputy, I'm afraid I won't because I've literally only got one minute and I did give way multiple times in my opening um, remarks. I believe, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the measures put forward in this bill that we've debated with these amendments today give the NHS what it needs to further integrate, to deliver the local services it needs and, crucially, move us a huge step forward to tackling the challenge posed by social care for future generations. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The question is that new clause 49 be read a second time. As mayors that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. 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 Division. Clear the lobby. The question is that new clause 49 be read a second time. As mayors, that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. no. Tell us for the ayes, Steve Double and Craig Whitaker. Tell us for the noes, Colleen Fletcher and Liz Twist.
Order! Order! The eyes to the right, 272. The nose to the left, 246. Thank you. The eyes to the right, 272. The nose to the left, 246. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Unlock. Order. Under the order of the House of today, I must now put questions necessary to bring to a conclusion proceedings on new clause 49 and other new clauses and amendments in this group. The question is that new clause 49 be added to the bill. As many as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 102. Amendment 102. I'm looking for the Honourable Member for Basingstoke. Amendment 102 has been selected for separate decision. I call Mrs. Maria Miller to move Amendment 102 formally. Liam, can someone else do it on her behalf? Um, the minister can move it formally. Formally. That's all. There's great excitement on the other side, but there's no doubt about the procedure here, uh, as the minister has already indicated that he had intended to accept Amendment 102. It is perfectly in order for the minister to move Amendment 102. The question is that Amendment 102 be made to the bill. As many as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment number 114 has been selected for separate decision. I call Jeremy Hunt to move Amendment 114 formally. Beg to move, Madam Deputy Speaker. The question is that Amendment 114 be made to the bill. As may as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Um, we now come to Government Amendments 25 to 28. I call the Minister to move Government Amendments 25 to 28 formally. Moved formally. The question is that Amendments 25 to 28 be made. As may as that opinion say aye. On oh, the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 72 has been selected for separate decision. I call Justin Matters to move Amendment yeah. 72. Yeah. Beg to move, Madam Deputy yeah. Speaker. The question is that Amendment 72 be made to the bill. As many as that opinion say aye. aye. On the contrary, no. no. Division, clear the lobby.
The question is that order. Really, people are being very rude in this chamber this evening. Order means order. The question is that Amendment 72 be made to the bill. As many as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. no. Uh, tell us for the ayes, Colleen Fletcher and Liz Twist. Tell us for the noes, Steve Double and Craig Whitaker. <laughs>